big bill is spending the money. <laughs> Shooting the moon. Excellent. Well, my name is Wade Crowfoot and I serve as our California Natural Resources Secretary. And I want to welcome you to this meeting of the Ocean Protection Council. This is a new experience for us in that we are meeting in a hybrid format. Um, those of us who are here in person, including council members are in downtown Sacramento at our new natural resources headquarters. And I think we're also joined by dozens of uh, partners and members of the public from across the state. So the first thing I'd ask for is your patience today as we navigate this hybrid format. I think we're excited to be back in person and also recognize the benefit of participants joining from all areas of the state uh, through the online format. So we're gonna work our way through this as best we can. I have some opening remarks, but before uh, I launch into those, uh, if we could, I would um, share that uh, controller Betty Yee is unable to attend today. And Christina Kunkel, her deputy controller for environmental policy is joining, big thanks. Uh, Secretary Blumenfeld, our, my colleague at Cal EPA is not able to join us today. And Katie Landau from the Cal EPA executive team is joining. And then um, both of our legislative members uh, are not able to join because they're in session. Uh, and then uh, Mike Brown, our other public member is not able to join. So we are a small but mighty crew uh, on the council today. And then thanks as always for being here, uh, council member Diamond. So uh, if, we could, if we could, let's please call the roll. Secretary Crowfoot. Here. Council member Lando. Here. Council member Kunkel. Here. And council member Diamond. Here. Thank you. So it is a very active time in Sacramento in that the state's annual budget uh, is being finalized uh, actually just a couple blocks from where we sit. Uh, Governor Newsom issued a May revision of his proposed budget and then the legislature recently uh, issued its budget. And as I understand it, Governor Newsom and the legislature are finalizing details and harmonizing uh, those two proposals. So I won't go into detail today on the potential funding for our oceans and coast work, but I can tell you in both the governor's budget and the legislature's budget, there are a lot of important investments that we will be excited to share with you once the budget dust settles um, when we meet uh, later this uh, summer, fall. Today, the council is gonna be making uh, several important decisions to advance goals in our strategic, uh, plan, uh, our strategic plan. This includes funding for sea level rise science, planning and habitat vulnerability assessments, wetland restoration, kelp forest monitoring, and updated science to inform fisheries management. So lots of lot, lots happening here today. Um, we always welcome public comment. And so I wanna share a little bit, little bit about the rules for public comment. Um, we will be taking public comment after items four through seven um, with, a, with uh, a comment on any non-agenda items on uh, at item nine. Um, if you do have something you'd like to share that's not specifically related to one of the agenda items, we'll take that comment um, at uh, item nine. Uh, after each presentation uh, on items four through seven, I'll invite public comment. If you wish to make a comment or are attending in person, I should say, if you wish to make a comment and are attending in person, simply line up at the podium. We'll take in-person public comment first. After all the in-person in attendees have spoken, we'll take public comment from those joining us virtually. If you're joining us through Zoom, please raise your virtual hand. That's the button with the hand on the bottom of your screen. And we will unmute you, announce your name, and you'll be able to provide your comment to the council. If you have called into the meeting via telephone, press pound two to raise your hand. Depending on how you have accessed the meeting, you may also need to unmute yourself. Public comment is limited to two minutes each so we can get through uh, all of our business today and ensure that we can hear from all public commenters. And there'll be a timer on the screen to track your allotted time. Anyone interested in providing comment will need to raise her or his hand by the end of the agenda presentation. <clears throat> Hands raised after that time will not be placed in the queue for comment. So again, items four through item seven, we're gonna have public comment. Our OPC staff will provide a presentation 
Uh, by the end of that presentation, please raise your virtual hand if joining from Zoom or press pound two on the phone, or if you're in person, come up to the podium and we will look forward to your public comment. Uh, let me turn it over to council members for any updates or announcements they may have. All right, we'll get right into it. Uh, so uh, first up is, uh, as always, uh, we start off with a, an update from our executive director of the OPC, who also serves as our Deputy Secretary for Oceans and Coasts, Mark Gold. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, so uh, a lot of stuff that we're gonna cover uh, in the meeting itself, I'm not going to get into uh, detail right now. So I'll give you some of the highlights. Um, first of all, is that it's always exciting during the summer um, uh, because we have uh, the addition of our summer interns. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly introduce them um, and the schools they're from. This is the second year we've done this program. It was incredibly successful um, in, in summer one. Um, and we're really excited to work with uh, the group of students that we have here. They're all pretty much rising juniors and seniors, or some exceptions there. Um, but we have Alyssa Jane um, from UC Santa Barbara, uh, Gloria Jin from USC. So that shows I'm not that biased. I, I, I did allow a Trojan to get through the entire process. Um, and uh, Gloria is going to work with us on uh, communications. Um, uh, working with our, our new communications manager, Stacey Hayden, who we'll talk about in a sec. Um, then we have Jazz Martin from uh, Humboldt Polytechnic Institute. So I actually, I think got that right. Or, um, and she's gonna work on fisheries issues. I'm sorry, they, they are gonna work on fisheries issues, my mistake. Um, Ty Lay um, from UC Riverside um, uh, will work on microplastics. Elizabeth Wynn um, from UC um, San Diego uh, will work on equity. Um, and uh, Emily Zhao, um, who's not part of the program, but is part of this um, longstanding relationship we have with Stanford University, um, and she will be working with us on tribes. So we're really excited about that. On uh, the staff front, we have two new staff uh, that, again, we're really excited about joining the OPC team. Uh, we have Dr. Wei Wang. Um, and she's our offshore wind program manager. So um, as we all know, offshore wind has become such a high priority for the state of California and to have someone with her expertise um, is just wonderful. She has modeling and remote sensing expertise. She's been working on offshore wind as a researcher, postdoctoral researcher at um, Cal Poly SLO um, for the last few years. And she has a PhD from UC Irvine. Um, we're also welcoming Stacy Hayden, our new communications manager. She has nearly two decades of experience in the comms field. Um, she came to us from the Delta um, Protection Commission. Um, and she, on her, on her own, her interests have been as a naturalist. She's a certified UC um, California naturalist. She volunteers uh, for the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary, as well as the Point, Point Reyes um, National Park Service and the efforts there. And she is a photographer. Um, so we're really very, very happy to have um, Stacy and UA on board. So um, great, great to see our team uh, in that way. On what we're doing sort of item by item on climate, a lot, we're gonna talk about um, sea level rise um, issues a lot um, in this meeting, but I do wanna let people know the sea level rise action plan, which we approved here um, at our last meeting, there's been all sorts of comments received, um, edits are getting made um, and the sea level rise leadership team uh, we'll have final review of that effort in the coming weeks. So I'm um, doing very, very well on that. And the comments have been very helpful um, in that regard. On equity, uh, a, a lot of action going on in the equity front. Um, people may recall this meeting was going to be sort of the big equity tribe meeting. Um, we moved it back um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, but most importantly, we have the equity plan that's been put together. Um, uh, Maria Rodriguez has really spearheaded that effort on behalf of our staff, um, working with the Better World Group and some of the top environmental justice leaders um, in the state of California have been part of an advisory group helping in that regard. And uh, the public comment on period closes on that um, next week. Um, and so we are ready um, for having the equity plan before this body um, at our September meeting. At the tribal engagement strategy, um, incredibly excited. Um, uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot, for your engagement on this. 
um, to green light to start our tribal consultation process. And so that we're, we're really excited about that. We think it's a very strong um, uh, engagement strategy um, that really came uh, from a lot of effort from our assistant secretary, Geneva Thompson, Mike Escrow, who's our tribal liaison um, for OPC, um, uh, Jen Eckerly as well. Um, and uh, we, we had numerous tribal listening sessions and putting that together. So we're very excited about that. Our hope is we can get that to the finish line um, by September. That might be a little bit ambitious, but something that we really are striving to do. Um, and the reason why is we have a lot of other things teed up for that meeting um, that on environmental justice as well as um, uh, tribes. Um, and it's really gonna be an extraordinary agenda um, from the standpoint of really trying to augment um, our existing tribal marine stewardship program uh, for MPAs, um, which has been uh, really a great success so far and, and hopefully expanding that to be a statewide program, but also starting a small grants program for tribes and a small grants program for environmental justice communities um, which we haven't done before. And, and we're really excited about um, starting that uh, and really having those two, those two policies going forth at the same time as, as moving forward with those um, uh, funding efforts um, really shows, you know, trying to put our money where our mouth is and, and, and making sure that the strategies aren't just paper strategies. Other things, and I'll just briefly touch upon because I know I'm at time, um, microplastics, there, there will soon be a call um, in the near future um, on, on projects related to microplastics and implementing the microplastic strategy and filling in a lot of the research data gaps. So that's important. Um, we're making progress on the restoration and mitigation plan policy. It's kind of exciting to be working with the scientific community. Jen Eckerly, Mike Esco are leading that effort working with our friends here at Ocean Science Trust um, in, in getting that forward and really getting some very candid viewpoints from the um, science, marine science community, which I think is gonna really help on that. Um, another cool thing that's been going on is the Ask the Researcher program. If you haven't had a chance to see that um, uh, for part of the uh, looking at the um, long-term monitoring results for marine protected areas um, and really part of that whole decadal management review that'll be out early next year. Um, it's really been a cool program. Lindsay Benito, um, want to give her major props. And by the way, she's also getting married this weekend. So she did a double major props. <laughs> Um, for showing up here with that right on right on around the corner. So thank you, Lindsay. But it's really been a fun program. If you haven't had a chance to see it online, it's totally worth it. Um, uh, um, working with our partners at Fish and Wildlife, really hand in glove. It's been great to see that sort of collaboration working together. And um, uh, also Strategic Earth has been great on this whole thing. And, and just the community really has gotten into asking the, the um, researchers some of the top marine biologists in the in the state questions about their work and, and it's been very candid and, and everybody's given it right reviews. On aquaculture action plan, um, also uh, moving forward in that regard. Um, so we, we just internally received a, a draft we're supposed to look at, I think by Friday, um, we'll see how well we can actually get there in doing so. But just that's just to show you that we're making project um, progress on something that's really very, very critical for the state of California. And then last, but certainly not least, I know it's on a lot of people's minds um, on offshore wind. Um, this, uh, this last week was an, a milestone week for the state of California where the Coastal Commission voted unanimously, once again, this time for the Central Coast um, lease sale consistency determination um, for uh, uh, potential offshore wind development. Um, and so now both lease sale areas off of Humboldt and, and Central California um, have been approved um, unanimously um, by the Coastal Commission. It's a conditional approval to make sure that our marine resources and fishing um, uh, communities um, are being adequately protected, also tribes as well. Um, and so really, I wanna give major props to the Coastal Commission as well to um, our own team led by um, Justine Kimball and really getting an unbelievable amount of information to be part of those consistency determinations across the finish line in record time. I mean, to think that the Coastal Commission did two CDs from cradle to grave on something of this scope and scale in less than a year is unbelievable. Um, it might be unprecedented in the history of the Coastal Act. So 
Um, just wanted to, to let you guys know that was happening. And then also in play, always something going on in offshore wind. Um, further discussion on Assembly Bill 525 targets uh, um, in setting both the short and long-term targets, 2030, 2045. Just a lot more discussions that are occurring in that realm on the longer term target and what the potential is for California to move forward um, with uh, floating offshore wind in a sustainable fashion that, that really is going to benefit the state um, uh, from a renewable energy perspective, but also protect our extraordinary natural resources and um, tribal cultural resources. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark, and an enthusiastic welcome to uh, both our new colleagues uh, who are, have joined OPC and then our interns, who, which we're really excited to have uh, this summer. Uh, great that you're here, and I know you're going to do great, uh, wonderful work over uh, the coming months. So let's turn it to Liz Whiteman, uh, who leads our Ocean Science Trust. Thank you, Chair Crawford, Council members. As per usual, a couple of quick updates from me, um, starting with goal one of the strategic plan and specifically sea level rise, not to jump ahead of the next agenda item, but just to say, um, after personally contributing to the 2017 science report, Rising Seas um, in California, that we at OST are just ready and excited to really work with OPC and support um, this truly integrated science policy task force to update the guidance and make it really pra pragmatic, practical, actionable. Two um, quick points to bring into the conversation at this time. The first is that I want to add my recognition to the many tools, models, great data sets um, that have been developed in the last couple of years by state and federal scientists, by academia, by nonprofits. And we really want to, during this effort, be as inclusive of those um, available resources and importantly, look for ways to leverage them and align them with the science so that we can do our part with OPC to make sure everybody's planning for a sea level rise in as consistent a way as, as possible. Second, um, I express our shared commitment to addressing the equity and environmental justice dimensions of this issue. We know that low resourced and marginalized frontline communities are among the most threatened by sea level rise. So as we develop this guidance um, and think about its uptake by local jurisdictions, um, we really want to do so in a way that it is accessible and usable by all in California. And that's something that's going to take some thought and discussion with the task force and in collaboration with OPC. So that actually transitions to a quick update um, on goal two of the OPC strategic plan, equity and environmental justice. Uh, and I hope you don't mind me using this venue to lift uh, a project that OP OST has been conducting um, with support from multiple private foundations to work with an interdisciplinary group of social scientists and in collaboration with tribal um, representatives and community-led organizations to develop evidence-based recommendations for advancing the social equity dimensions of nature-based coastal adaptation. We were really privileged to convene a virtual briefing on this topic a couple of weeks ago with the Q&A discussion, um, science-based discussion moderated by Evelyn Sloan from the Coastal Conservancy and included uh, panelists, Dr. Giuliano Khalil from Middlebury Institute, Dr. Kutcher Rising Baldi from Cal Poly Humboldt, and Dr. Marcus Griswold from the Calm Waters Group. And I just wanted to say here my gratitude and thanks to the Coastal Conservancy and all of their part, all of the panelists for their partnership on this effort. We really look forward to sharing the uh, final report from that work in the coming weeks. Turning to the science advisory team and a very brief update, reiterating uh, something that Mark has already mentioned uh, related to goal three. Uh, in general, one of the new activities that we've really found value in, um, we're testing and piloting it right now, is to convene quarterly-ish meetings with this OPC staff and members of the, the science advisory team, anchored by the OPC strategic plan goals, but trying to provide an additional informal venue for science discussion, science deliberation, 
um, on the priority issues uh, for OPC. And the specific example that we've been able to delve in more deeply over the last couple of months is providing support for the development of OPC's restoration and mitigation policy for coastal and ocean habitats. And I think the culminating meeting for, for that is actually happening tomorrow afternoon. Um, so uh, look forward to other opportunities to engage with you all and the science advisory team. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. Any questions for Mark or Liz? All right, I would like to mention that <clears throat> State Senator Ben Allen is joining uh, remotely. And uh, as a result of what we call the Bagley Keene Act in the state, which is uh, state laws that govern uh, our meetings, um, he is joining as an audience member today because we didn't pro provide advance notice of ex where exactly he would be joining from. But Senator Allen is joining um, as an uh, audience member. And so he's very much uh, present and listening to presentations, as well as our public member, Mike Brown, who I believe is also uh, in the audience uh, online. So um, thank you both for, for joining here. So we're gonna jump into the meat of our agenda today. And uh, it starts with item four. And before each of our action items, we identify our, the part of our strategic plan that each action addresses. And we think that's really important to stay focused on the priorities that we're driving forward. So these set of actions advance our strategic plan goal one, which is to safeguard coastal and marine ecosystems and communities in the face of climate change. And these advance the specific objective 1.1 under that broad climate resilience goal. And that is to build resilience to sea level rise, coastal storms, erosion, and flooding. So the action we'll consider today is uh, the approval of disper dis disbursement of funds, essentially funding, advancing sea level rise, planning, and vulnerability assessments. And this is a <clears throat> set of actions in three parts. Um, the first, updating the 2018 state sea level rise guidance. The second potential funding item, regional sea level rise adaptation guidance for the San Francisco Bay. And then the third, uh, considering funding for a statewide vulnerability assessment of coastal habitats. And so in successive order, we'll ask our colleagues, Justine, Ella, and then Justine once again, uh, to present on these items. Once they present, we'll take public comment specifically on these items, and then we'll open it up to council discussion. So Justine, welcome. Um, my you are probably queuing oh up your God. slides and there they, there they are. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon, council members, and thanks, Liz, for teeing up this item and the, the introduction there. I will be presenting uh, for your consideration an update to OPC sea level, sea level rise guidance. Next slide. As mentioned, uh, this item implements goal one and objective 1.1 and specifically target 1.1.6, which states that OPC will update the sea level rise guidance in 2023 and every five years thereafter to support uh, policies, planning and operations. Next slide. And so the recommendation from staff is to fund up to $400,000 to California Ocean Science Trust to convene in partnership with OPC, a scientific task force to lead this effort. Next slide. Starting with a bit of a primer on global sea level rise. Uh, global sea level rise is caused mainly by the thermal expansion of warming ocean waters and melting land ice. And it is one of the most obvious manifestations of climate change. From the figure, you can see that uh, global sea levels have risen about eight to nine inches since 1880. And uh, that uh, sea levels are continuing to rise at about 3.3 millimeters per year, which is the typical rate that your fingernails uh, grow. Mm -hmm. However, we know that this rate is about double what was observed in the 20th century, and this rate is expected to continue to increase. So it's not right to say that we expect that rate to, to stay the same over time. And we have really good measurements from this, uh, from tide gauges and satellite altimetry. Next slide. 
And then while 3.3 millimeters per year is the global average rate right now, there is considerable local and regional variability that needs to be understood. This is called relative sea level rise, and it's a measure of what an area is actually experiencing and takes into account vertical land motion and like uh, glacial adjustments. And so I like this figure here from NOAA, which shows a variety of uh, locations and rates of sea level rise. Um, the rates that you can see there, it's actually a, a linear trend that's been fit over multiple decades of tide gauge data, but you can just see the, the range of rates. You can see in places like Alaska, there's actually decreasing sea levels. Um, for the West Coast here, you can see that um, over the, the period of time that this is um, trended, uh, we're about where uh, the average global sea level rise rates um, are. Um, and this variation, like I said, is, is due to tectonics and then also regional differences, things like um, El Nino Southern Oscillation for the West Coast. Um, and then again, this doesn't take into future predictions, uh, take into account. Next slide. Uh, which is why future predictions at a particular location are so important. Uh, predictions have also gotten a lot more confident over the years, uh, but there are still some major uncertainties. The main unknown, of course, is still what emissions pathway the, the world will ultimately take over the coming years. You can see from this figure um, the range of possibility for sea level rise, depending on uh, what those greenhouse gas uh, pathway, pathway that the world will take, um, and then how the major ice sheets will respond to this ocean and atmosphere warming. Uh, there is roughly 230 feet of sea level rise locked up in land ice. And so how fast that melting will occur will play a big uh, role in what rates we'll see going forward. Next slide. And so because of all these factors and the more information that we're getting every year, updating sea level rise predictions is really critical and updating those regularly. In February 2022, an interagency federal group released updated predictions for the U.S. They showed increased certainty through 2050. And for the Northwest region, which includes California, the, the high emission scenario showed around a foot by 2050. Um, additionally, they found that Flooding events are projected to increase in the 2030s, again, um, due to those regional ocean dynamics um, and orbital dynamics, and uh, that there is a greater acceleration of sea level rise expected by the end of the century and beyond. So this report is really helpful to understand at a big picture what the trends are, um, but it really, uh, we need more uh, higher resolution for local and regional uh, decision making. Next slide which is where OPC's guidance comes in. Um, uh, if you haven't looked at it in a while, it, it provides projections for 12 tide gauge locations using a probabilistic approach, as well as guidance on how to select a sea level rise value and recommendations for planning and adaptation. Uh, this is an example you can see for the tide gauge in, in San Francisco, and you can see the, the range of um, predictions uh, there for that location. It was last updated in 2018, and since that time has been widely cited and applied for sea level rise planning and policy efforts. Next slide. And so this project would form, um, as Liz mentioned, a task force that would lead the update, building on the most recent and best available science, as well as develop practical guidance and approaches for end users. While of course, coordinating with partners and to leverage efforts as much as possible. Um, this will be convened um, with our partners at the California Ocean Tr Science Trust who led the effort um, in 2017 and 2018. Next slide. So based on expertise and continuity with recent and ongoing related projects, task force, task force members have already been identified and committed to participating should the council approve funding today. We think this group is a really extraordinary group of scientists to lead the effort. Um, in terms of timeline, we, we hope to convene the task force as early as July and complete the update as as uh, stated in the strategic plan um, in 2023, the sort of exact timing on that will depend on how much sort of model crunching and additional analysis is needed. Um, but we are planning to bring the, the final document or the draft document to the September 2023 council meeting for your review. Next slide.
And that's the item. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justina. We're going to pull off on, on public, public comment and discussion before we go to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, council <clears throat> members. Thanks for your time here today. My name is Ella McDougall. I'm a climate change program manager with OPC. Just give one second for slides to change. Um, Today I'm discussing the second item in our sea level rise suite of projects, the regional sea level rise adaptation guidance for the San Francisco Bay. Slide please. This item supports OPC's strategic goal one, as well as objective one, building resilience to sea level rise, coastal storms, erosion, and flooding. Target 1.1.5 directs the OPC to support a requirement for coastal adaptation plans or elements, including the development of templates and minimum standards, for said adaptation plans. This project today will support planning within the Bay Area and its nine counties and develop templates and minimum standards as directed in this strategic plan target. Slide please. Staff recommends the council approve $2,179,843 to the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission from the Environmental License Plate Fund. This funding will go to two separate but related components of this project both of which build resilience in the San Francisco Bay. The first component is the development of the regional sea level rise adaptation guidance for the San Francisco Bay. And the second is to be used to advance the beneficial use of sediment in and around the Bay, especially for habitat restoration. I will first discuss sea level rise followed by a sediment use second. Slide please. So we're well aware sea level rise poses a significant threat to the San Francisco Bay communities, infrastructure and habitats. Mile by mile, the Bay shoreline accounts for a third of the length of the coast of California. However, according to the Bay Adapt Joint Platform, the Bay could incur two thirds of the economic repercussions of sea level rise. The Bay Area represents a very complex network of various authorities, local governments and community stakeholders. And even more importantly, the Bay Area is rich in diverse, underserved, and historically redlined communities who deserve the support needed to combat the impacts of climate change. Slide, please. BCDC has worked tirelessly to become a trusted partner in adaptation in the Bay Area. In 2020, they embarked on the Bay Adapt Joint Platform process to create a shared vision and strategy to equitably address the impacts of sea level rise throughout the Bay. Through intense collaboration and strategic thinking, a shared set of solutions were created. These included guiding principles, actions, and objectives that center people, nature, and science. This includes community-focused planning and equitable support for low-income communities dealing with these challenges at the front lines. Today's funding supports advancement for the Bay Adapt Joint Platform. Slide, please. Additionally, BCDC has also built the Adapting to Rising Tides program and portfolio, which includes sea level rise science and mapping tools, planning guidance, and staff support to communities planning for sea level rise adaptation. Products of this program include the Shoreline Flood Explorers, Vulnerability Mapping, and the newly released Adaptation Roadmap. Slide, please. With this tremendous buildup, OPC has worked with BCDC staff to create a project that will move the needle on sea level rise adaptation in the Bay Area. First, a task force will, de will be deployed to help champion the project, which will lead to the development of a regional sea level rise adaptation guidance for the San Francisco Bay. Most critically, this guidance will include a shared set of criteria or minimum standards and a framework for standardizing sea level rise implementation plans within the counties and subregions of the San Francisco Bay Area. And this strongly builds off of Bay Adapt's One Bay Vision. Slide, please. Following the development of the guidance and the set of criteria, BCDC will scope an incentive structure that will help streamline sea level rise implementation planning at the county and subregional level. This may include further funding or streamlining of other permitting mechanisms. This project allows for increased BCDC staff capacity to help communities utilize the criteria and standards for their sea level rise planning efforts. This piece is critical to support low income and under-resourced communities who may need extra support. Finally, EcoAtlas, which is a tool that is used to monitor wetland habitats in the Bay Area, 
will be leveraged to show the progress and status of adaptation planning and projects within the region. And this will facilitate increased accessibility of resources and knowledge sharing throughout the Bay communities and organizations. Slide please. Now to quickly discuss the piece on the second piece of funding in this uh, project, beneficial use of sediment for wetland restoration projects in the San Francisco Bay. This funding will leverage a pre-existing EPA wetlands program development grant to BCDC that further advances sediment management and policies. The outcomes of this component of the project include stakeholder informed reports for next steps and roles in sediment management, a San Francisco Bay Plan amendment for sediment use and potential funding strategies. Slide please. That concludes my uh, presentation. Look forward to questions after the next presentation. Thanks so much, Ella. <clears throat> Would invite Justine back to the podium for uh, an update on uh, proposed funding for the statewide vulnerability assessment of coastal habitats. Great. Yes. And um, good afternoon again, council members. Um, yeah, so this item uh, for your consideration is a statewide vulnerability assessment of coastal habitats. Next slide. This item implements uh, goal one, 1.1 and target 1.1.7, which commits to working with partners to increase wetland acreages uh, supported by a statewide inventory by 2022. Next slide. Additionally, goal three includes development of an action plan for addressing rocky intertidal and beach habitat loss by 2023 and increasing seagrass acreage uh, by 2025. Uh, as you'll see, the, the habitats that I just mentioned, uh, wetlands, uh, beaches, rocky intertidal, and eelgrass are the focus of this project. Next slide. And so the recommendation from staff is to fund up to 750,000 to the San Francisco Estuary Institute to refine and enhance the next phase of the coastal wetlands, beaches and watersheds inventory by integrating remote sensing data and assessing vulnerability to sea level rise. This project is also a partnership with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and that partnership funding is part of this package. Next slide. So I will cover um, the background. The, the first phase of this work is, is still ongoing uh, since 2020 and will be wrapped up in a few months. The objective was to develop an updated base map of coastal habitats for the purposes of tracking changes in abundance, distribution, and diversity. It involved spinning up a subcommittee of experts as part of the California Wetlands Monitoring Work Group and focused specifically on the California Aquatic Resource Inventory, or CARI, as the base map. CARI is already a well-known mapping resource integrated into the Eco Atlas platform, which you just heard about um, from Ella, uh, used by scientists and practitioners. And so the first phase really identified and integrated new relevant data sets into that CARI base map, modified the standing standard operating procedures, and then is developing a dashboard within EcoAtlas to visualize summary information. Next slide. So in all, with the guidance of the subcommittee, 50 different data sets have already uh, were, were considered, 14 have already been incorporated, and 11 more are still being pursued. Keep in mind that some of these data sets are statewide and, and massive, so it is a really big effort to incorporate them. Uh, most of the data sets are airborne imagery data, such as this example, which you can see the delineation and classification of different coastal habitat features. Next slide. And again, because we're focused on the strategic plan, uh, we're focused on these habitats that I that I mentioned earlier. And so this is an example of what I wanted to show is that's integrated into this CARI base map. So I'm showing Elkhorn Slough here as an example, and you can see the different habitat types um, mapped and, um, and visualized here. And then if there's a couple click throughs here, so if you could do that slowly, so like click through one more. There. And so here you can actually see um, when that data was collected. And um, you can see most of this data was collected in the early 2000s. Um, and then next slide. This is the resolution. We're working on making this legend a little bit more understandable with an actual like, you know, feet or meters right now. This is like a, uh, um, a little bit not understandable. Well, you can see that the higher resolution is the darker and the, the lower resolution is the lighter. So you'll be actually able to see. And then this is where the data is actually being pulled from. And you can see what data set um, each 
portion of this is. So all of that is part of the CARI data set and will be visualizable um, by users and should be really helpful. Next slide. Um, and then additionally, as part of this project, we're developing a dashboard to even more easily um, be able to uh, extract information. And so this, um, this is an example. Um, we've broken it up into regions. So you'll be able to pull summary statistics from statewide, or you'll be able to look at, as this example shows, like the San Francisco Bay region and click on it and see summary stats for those categories and what percentage of the coastal habitats each are making up. And then you can click on like wetlands and see even more detail of the habitats that are making up the, you know, the sub habitats that are making up those larger categories. Categories. Next slide. And then we've talked about doing a sort of a tracking um, as part of the dashboard where we can actually have the targets in the strategic plan and what percentage of the targets we're meeting based on the, the compiled acreages that we're pulling from the carry data set. Um, so these are all in the works and we're excited um, that this will now be available to a large audience. Um, next slide. So moving to the second phase of work and what this item is focused on, um, this pro project um, is going to explore developing maps at 10 meter or higher resolution using a combination of radar and optical satellite um, airborne sensors, uh, oh, satellite or airborne sensors. As a reminder, this is different from the first phase, which really focused on imagery. Um, this is just a different um, uh, different sensors and, and different data types. And so integrating the, these new remote sensing approaches requires a machine learning model for every new data set. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, this project is a partnership with JPL to identify the most promising approaches and then develop those machine learning models to absorb those into the CARI base maps. I'll add that the motivation for this um, started to come from when we were working on phase one and becoming aware of the age of many of those data sets and not feeling completely confident using those older data sets. Um, so pursuing the remote sensing data sets will allow us to, to ground truth as well as spatial and temporal gaps is needed. Next slide. And then finally, a sea level rise vulnerability assessment will be performed on the updated base map for the purposes of identifying vulnerable regions and acreage loss estimates, as well as upland habitat migration areas. We are aware of previous coastal habitat vulnerability assessments at different like, local and regional scales, and we're going to leverage those to ma the maximum extent possible. And this assessment, as I mentioned earlier, really underpins the development of these plans that we have in the strategic plan, the development of the wetland action plan, the beach resilience resiliency plan and the Rocky Intertidal Action Plan, we really see this as sort of that foundation of information to, to support development of those plans. Uh, and next slide. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Justine and Ella. Really uh, impressive presentations and impressive work. Uh, I want to, before we move to public comment, ask if there are any points of clarification uh, or questions to clarify the presentations from any of our council members. Yes. Hi, if I could ask the sea level rise technical guidance, I guess Justine, this would be for you. So thank you both for the presentations. They were fantastic. Um, but I guess one question would be, have we received specific feedback on the 2018 guidance? I mean, it's great guidance, right? But we know this is such a critical gap between, you know, it's like filling, okay, this is what we know what's happening. This is what needs to be done. Um, and so, yeah, so is that feel, you feel like you've got practical feedback already in terms of any adjustments that could be made? Et cetera, or is that part of the planning process? That's a great question. I thought about including um, a little bit, but you know, there's there's a lot there, and I might see if Liz wants to chime in too. Um, we have received a lot of feedback. You know, most of it really positive. People are um, really using the guidance. I would say the the main point that we do here is, you know, there is still a little bit of confusion on on how you really choose what numbers to use for a particular location or for a particular project for a regional effort versus local. And, you know, we tend to come down to, you know, well, what is your risk tolerance and things, but people, you know, I feel like that's a little bit of a barrier where, you know, people don't know what their risk tolerance is too. So, you know, I think that's one area that we've continuously heard and we want to dig into um, this time around. I would say that's the main feedback we've heard. What, what would you chime in with? Oh, yeah, Mark, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Liz. 
No, just to completely agree with you, Justine, that uh, the, we were grappling with everything was uncertain last time we were doing this. And it was how do you present some pathway through the uncertainty? And in doing so, I think we presented too many options um, mm -hmm. as too many numbers. And so I think the, the opportunity of the updated science and the interagency report is to um, move forward from some of that almost paralyzing uncertainty of the first time around. And I think what's cool about that um, uh, Liz and Justine and, and council members is that the national assessment leads you in that direction anyways, right? Because they, they've thrown out the window the extreme doomsday scenarios, right? So this whole extraneous argument that we would often get into on H++ is now out the window, right? And it doesn't mean that couldn't happen in 150 years, but we're really focusing on between now and 2100. And, and that narrowing, I think, is going to lead to a much more effective um, and productive um, guidance. And one of the things also, and, and I know Secretary Crowfoot has seen this and commented on um, when he in, uh, interviewed Ben Hamlington as part of a secretary series, they're also going to add the number of flood days. And I think that's something that people can relate to as opposed to how many feet or whatever, which is confusing to people as opposed to, oh, that's my community beach and it's gonna be flooded now 100 days a year where before it was only flooded one day a year. And so I think those things are gonna help moving forward. Fantastic, um, thank you both. And um, one other thing I'll just throw in there, uh, this was a recent workshop that my organization was, was hosting uh, and I realized I should actually take a moment. So I think, well, I guess this happened at the last public meeting. Um, I am no longer with UC Berkeley. Um, I now head the Environmental Law Institute. I feel like I should publicly state that for the record um, since I have moved from academia to, academia to, to NGO. Um, so apologies for not mentioning it the, that at the outset. Um, but we were recently hosting a workshop and talking about, although challenging, the ability to try and translate the vertical sea rise to horizontal sea rise to any extent possible, the difference that makes for on the ground managers, obviously incredibly challenging to do, um, but, but, but just flag that. The other thing that came up um, is, is there any or what is basically the communication between, I mean, we funded these efforts on communicating sea level rise broadly, you kind of writ large the project to the public. This is speaking specifically to managers and kind of adaptation managers, etc. But is there any kind of formal lines of communication between those two efforts? Um, the, the communications project that we had previously yeah. and the update. I mean, I think this would, we haven't scoped that yet, but I, we certainly, you know, especially with Stacy now on board, we have, um, you know, a really good path forward for our communications over the office. And this would be a, a huge thing to, to push out and, and get people interested and, and, I wouldn't say excited, but uh, interested <laughs> about. So I think for sure that's the plan. Uh, we don't have that, you know, ironed out the okay. details yet. But yeah, um, just a just a great thing to think about. Thank you so much, Jesse. Yeah, sure. Um, can I put in one other comment? Please. Yeah, um, Ella, just one thing really quickly, um, and I'm not sure if this is a point of clarification or just a comment. Um, I know it's a small por portion of the budget. We're talking like five percent, but I just wanted to basically flag the beneficial use of sediment or you know particularly dredged material. Um, it's it, again, it's a relatively small part of the budget, but that's such an important kind of critical issue. I guess I'm just is going on the record stating maybe we can revisit that. Um, I'd love to hear updates about how that portion of the project again continues and whether there's additional support that we can provide on um, beneficial use in the future. So thank you. And I would just add to that, you know, want to want to echo what Council Member Diamond said around the importance, as I've been educated, of using that that beneficial sediment, that dredge sediment for habitat restoration. And that's a conversation that we're actively pursuing with the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of reforming guidelines for the use of that in the, in the bay. So really wanted to connect the dots there. And then I'll, I'll just um, piggyback on Council Member Diamond's comments as it relates to the, um, the, the, the use of the coming guidelines. You know, one thing that's changed since 2018 is we have a, a really strong uh, amount of coordination and collaboration across state agencies on sea level rise. Uh, you you know, of course, that we created this sea level uh, rise working group of uh, well over a dozen agencies, and then they developed this sea level rise action plan for state agencies. And so the request would be as, you know, if we indeed approve funding and as you build out 
the framework for the guidance to really engage uh, those agencies to ensure that the guidance is maximally useful and practical and also to engage local governments that are contending with uh, this challenge and will utilize the guidance so that you know the the guidance that that we collectively provide and the form that we provide it in is maximally useful for decision makers totally agree and we have discussed that yeah and last question again if this funding gets um, gets dispersed and uh, the project or the update happens when would we expect the update and guidance to be usable by state and local agencies well, we're hoping to bring it to the council for consideration of adoption uh, September 2023. But right. you know, we could have a draft earlier than that. Like I said, it's really sort of dependent on how much of this analysis needs to go into updating the numbers because we are leveraging, you know, a lot that's already being done, that's already funded. And as soon as it's done, we wanted to get used. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, to Councilmember Diamond's comments, we should. Uh, work with our new uh, communications leadership at OPC to really understand once we have that guidance to ensure that uh, we are amplifying it and explaining it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. So once again, if you are interested in providing public comment specifically on action items 4A through C. I, I think, oh, sorry. Um, oh, I did, sorry, Christine, I didn't. No, I yes, please. Okay, let's no. let, let we'll, we'll, you'll start us off after the public comment period. Does that work? No worries. Uh, so if you have uh, specific comments or comments specific to the, these four items, 4A through 4C, um, please do, if you're uh, joining by Zoom, raise your virtual hand. If you're joining by phone, um, two pound. And if you're in the room, uh, please make your way to the podium. And uh, once again, we will uh, take public comment first in the order of those uh, members of the public who are here in person. It doesn't look like there's any public comment uh, here in person. I think we've all gotten used to utilizing the online uh, format. So if we can then uh, turn it to our colleagues to uh, help announce uh, who is in the queue for public comment, we'd appreciate that. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Uh, the first speaker is actually going to be Senator um, Ben Allen. So I'm gonna go ahead and get him started without a timer. So. Thank you. Welcome, Senator Allen. Senator Allen, it looks like you're muted. All right. I'm going to go ahead and just move on to the next speaker and we'll see if he raises his hand again. So next speakers are going to be Deb Self, followed by Allison Pritchard and then Larry Goldspan. Deb, you have the floor. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Deb Self, Executive Director of Greater Fairlawns Association. We're a nonprofit working in close association with the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary to support scientific research, planning, and habitat restoration in the marine sanctuary. Um, first, quickly on item 4B, as former Executive Director of San Francisco Baykeeper and a member of the public, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the update on the development of regional sea level rise adaptation guidance for the Bay. And just to echo that historically red line communities deserve consistent and equitable planning at the county and regional level and increased BCDC staff to support these planning processes. Um, back to being executive director of Greater Fairlands Association regarding item 4C GFA supports funding of $750,000 to SFEI for enhancing the next phase of its coastal habitat inventory by integrating remote sensing data and assessing vulnerability to sea level rise. Um, I also wanted to say that the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary has conducted a thorough climate vulnerability assessment for species, habitats, and ecosystem services in the sanctuaries, that includes coastlines. This year, the sanctuary will be updating its assessment to incorporate new data. And GFA technical staff working with NOAA hope that this will um, engender some chances for uh, collaboration uh, to uh, leverage each other's work on looking at coastal resilience. I also want to recommend the Greater Farallon's Coastal Resilience Sediment Plan, which OPC funded to identify at-risk locations along the North Central California coastline. So thank you very much for, um, for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is going to be Allison Pritchard, followed by Larry Goldspan. Allison, you have the floor. Allison, it looks like you're off mute and you have the floor. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Allison Pritchard and I'm a legal and policy intern with the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin. Our mission is to protect and sustain the unique lands, waters, and biodiversity of West Marin. And our work strives to provide long-term protection and conservation of the unique ecosystems and rural communities of West Marin. Our coastal communities are very vulnerable to sea level rise, and we are dedicated to helping protect our communities plan and adapt to the climate crisis, but we need the best available science to do so. We have consistently supported a coordinated approach to California sea level rise planning with a focus on the protection of coastal resources, vulnerable communities, and the use of nature-based solutions rather than hard armoring. I wanna speak briefly to support um, item 4A and 4C. We support the approval of the disbursement of funds to advance sea level rise planning and update the 2018 sea level rise guidance. It has been six years since the 2018 data was released and longer since it was collected and organized. It is critical that these important state planning documents are updated in a timely fashion. Our coastal communities depend on it. Sadly, the science is only becoming more alarming each day and we must plan using the most current data. We are excited that a task force will be formed and it looks like a great group of esteemed experts. Thank you for your dedication to California's adaptive planning. We also support agenda item 4C. In order to protect California's vulnerable coastal resources, we need up-to-date information and monitoring. An updated inventory is key to preserving our existing wetlands, as well as planning for the upland migration of wetlands that are vulnerable to sea level rise. Of course, wetlands have a significant carbon sequestration potential as well. Thank you for your dedication to protecting California's remaining wetlands and estuaries. Thank you, Allison. Our next speaker is going to be Larry Goldspan, followed by Emily Parker. Larry, you have the floor. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and members of the OPC for having this meeting here today. On behalf of the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, I wanna thank Mark and Jen and Ella for their hard work in working with us. And that's never easy uh, to bring this to the, uh, to the OPC's attention and for a vote. I also would be remiss in not thanking Jen for being such a superb commissioner on BCDC itself. Bay Adapt, that voluntary collaborative arrangement that we put forth a couple of years ago and that was adopted last October is really the headliner here, although it necessarily is should be. Um, when you consider the large number of stakeholders from the public, nonprofit, and for-profit sectors that have pushed this forward, on behalf of 46 cities and nine counties and scores of special districts that touch the Bay, it's really important to note that your commitment to Bay Adapt will really help us jumpstart the implementation and ensure that the Bay Area is becoming and will continue to be and will always be resilient to rising sea levels. So we thank you for that. In addition, with regard to beneficial reuse, these funds will augment the US EPA grant that ultimately will result in a Bay Plan Amendment that will, knock on wood, ensure that larger percentages of dredging that occurs in San Francisco Bay will be reused for natural habitat purposes. So a former boss of mine once said, don't kill a sail. I will stop here and thank you in advance for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Larry, and thanks to the whole BCDC team for all you do. Next speaker is going to be Emily Parker, followed by Senator Ben Allen. Emily, you have the floor. Hi there, good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot and council members. My name is Emily Parker and I'm the coastal and marine scientist with Heal the Bay, an environmental nonprofit based in the LA region with over 35 years of experience keeping our coastal waters and watersheds healthy, safe, and clean. 
Heal the Bay wholeheartedly supports the council's funding of the presented sea level rise mitigation projects, in particular, phase two of the coastal wetlands, beaches, and watersheds inventory, and the sea level rise vulnerability, vulnerability assessment, along with the much needed update to the sea level rise guidance. As coastal defenders who are regularly out in our coastal zone surveying our local marine protected areas, our staff, interns, and volunteers are seeing firsthand every day the impacts of sea level rise on our local beaches. We are losing precious sandy beach habitat every day. Our coastal access infrastructure is at great risk and is already deteriorating, and our ability to monitor our coastal zone is decreasing as we're losing this access. We need immediate and bold action to confront these impacts, and this dedicated funding is a very necessary step. Heal the Bay has already provided comments on OPC's draft sea level rise action plan already mentioned earlier by Dr. Gold, and we're very much looking forward to seeing that final plan, working with the council on the updated sea level rise guidance and seeing the results of the vulnerability assessment. I'd like to thank both the council and OPC staff for their dedication to this issue and Heal the Bay supports this disbursement of funding. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Next speaker is going to be Senator Ben Allen, if he's available. Senator Allen, you have the floor. If you're there, your mic is muted. It may be that Senator Allen's gotten called to legislative business. I know the legislature is actively meeting right now. so. Uh, let if uh, if he's not able to pipe in, uh, let's move on and uh, see if there are any other uh, final public comments uh, commenters in the queue. That is it for public comment on item four. Thank you so much. That was relatively smooth for our first uh, hybrid queue. Um, Christina. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Uh, first, as California's chief fiscal officer, Controller Yee realizes that the riskiest response to sea level rise is inaction, and OPC is certainly staying active uh, in sea level rise research, planning, and implementation. So first for item 4A, the update is, of course, timely with the NOAA report, which provides us with greater confidence in the sea level rise projections and provides a clear message that without action, Sea level rise will devastate communities, people, wildlife, critical infrastructure, homes, businesses, our economies, and inequitably impact historically excluded communities. So in this update to the sea level rise guidance, it will be crucial to build on and elevate the confidence that we do have, particularly in those near-term projections and just elevating the comments of Justine and my fellow council members already. Um, as noted in the staff report, OPC's 2018 guidance is widely cited by federal, state, local agencies, also in academic papers, by university students, across a wide variety of disciplines. So I'm sure it's the primary source for sea level rise projections across the state, which is, so it will be, which is why it will be so important to lean in on what we do know and the narrowing of uncertainties in the update to this guidance. Um, just to note that the real estate industry also cites the sea level rise guidance. And just last month, I'm, I think we're all aware that Hawaii became the first state to require disclosure of sea level risk in real estate transactions. And I believe this legislation was actually inspired by a statewide sea level rise report, not dissimilar to this sea level rise guidance. So when we're seeing homes collapsing in the outer banks and in Hawaii, and a few years ago, closer to home in Pacifica, it just highlights the importance of this report and that it can inspire policy. Um, when State Lands Commission received vulnerability reports uh, from granted lands trustees in accordance with AB 691, we found inconsistency among grantees around interpreting which projections were appropriate, just like the example you gave, Justine, for varying infrastructure development and locations. So, and the best available science is just moving so quickly that I would almost recommend updating more than five years, but I know this is a monumental effort. And I just wanna be clear, I am not making that request of the council today. Okay. <laughs> um, the list of confirmed participation from the technical experts, that's quite impressive. I know the list isn't yet complete or I believe it's not yet complete. Uh, I did notice that there were not any representatives from the North Coast. Uh, as you know, the Humboldt Bay is experiencing the highest rate of relative sea level rise. 
on the entire US West Coast, uh, mostly due to tectonic subsidence. And there are many remarkable scientists and social scientists, uh, particularly at Cal Poly Humboldt and the Sea Level Rise Initiative that would be worth considering to contribute to this report. So thank you to Mark and your team for gathering this impressive group of ex experts and we look forward to updated projections. And I just have very, very brief comments on the, the BCD, BCDC funding. Um, that Bay ADAPT plan, it just represents unprecedented regional coordination and alignment and both already completed in the development of the plan and proposed as part of the plan. And without this coordination, we will almost certainly see inequitable impacts to historically excluded communities, piecemeal protective actions from the many jurisdictions in the Bay, uh, inconsistent interpretation again, and no way to quantify collective progress. So this funding is crucial to avoid substantial long-term costs and disjointed efforts. Controller Yi enthusiastically supports this, the staff recommendation to provide this funding to BCDC. And the funding again, like I said, from OPC is fantastic, but additional funding and resources are necessary to fully implement the larger effort of the Bay Adapt joint platform. Uh, so we just encourage the council and legislators and anyone listening to continue to advocate for additional funding for BCDC from the state. Thank you so much. Huge thanks, Christina, for those comments and to, to Controller Yi for, for her championing sea level rise resilience uh, as long as she's been on the OPC and even when she's not. Um, so uh, huge thanks there. Um, Want to just make sure we don't have any other council members with, with any final comments. I've got a few. Um, I would just say, I feel like we've come a long way on sea level rise resilience in just a few years. Um, we took this 2018 guidance, you know, as imperfect as it was and used it as a catalyst to bring together state agencies to really align around um, what we know about sea level rise, what we don't know, and what we should be doing. And that group uh, that came together uh, established certain principles that were governing our management uh, of our assets, our natural resources amidst sea level rise. And then that effort grew into, as I mentioned, this uh, statewide action plan focused on sea level rise. We have tremendous champions in our legislature and in the form of our governor on providing resources to address uh, sea level rise and coastal resilience. And this funding, I think, is critical to guide that, those investments and our efforts moving forward. Um, so I think there's almost nothing more important that we can be doing on OPC um, more than being really the point of the spear and helping us understand sea level rise and its impact on California and the world. Um, so I'll certainly be supporting uh, the funding uh, proposals here today. Director Gold. Um, thank you, Secretary Crofa. Just one thing, you know, as you were as you were speaking, it just sort of hit me that that you and Secretary Blumenfeld, um, you're you're both champions for making sure that we make this uh, really understandable and digestible to the general public. And one of the things I just want to highlight on the on the um, habitat vulnerability side is we're going to get to the point to be able to pick to your favorite beach and say, this is what we expect is going to happen at your beach um, by the end of century. And I think that's going to really change the way people relate to sea level rise in a completely different way. I mean, I, you heard from um, uh, Emily Parker from Heal the Bay about some of the things that are happening in the, in the LA region. I can tell you one of the beaches I grew up on was Westward Beach right near Zuma. It got destroyed this last year. It's basically gone, you know? And so from the standpoint of what's happening between, um, and I know that's just one specific example and it doesn't mean it's all due to sea level rise as opposed to storms, et cetera. But um, it's the sort of thing that people can really relate to saying, hey, I grew up in this area and that beach is gone, you know? Or that beach is, is completely different from how it was when I was a kid. And, and I, I'm really excited about that next effort and this, this marriage between SFEI and JPL um, that's really gonna be providing us very user-friendly um, ways to relate to sea level rise in a way that we really haven't been before. That's excellent. And I would mention that the improved understanding of, of the most vulnerable habitats will be helpful in so many ways as we build out our 30 by 30 effort to conserve 30% of California's lands and coastal waters by 2030. 
as we look to disperse and invest funding towards habitat priorities uh, front that are provided by the governor's office. And of course, also as um, scientists undertake the decadal review of our marine protected area network. So uh, yet again, really important uh, science information that's gonna lead decision-making. I wonder if uh, I can ask for a motion from uh, council members. Council member Diamond? So moved. <laughs> okay, and can I interpret your motion to move to adopt the proposed findings for all projects as recommended by staff, approve the projects as described and delegate to Director Gold the authority to implement the council's approval? That is an ideal interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so council member uh, Diamond moves the item. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you so much, Christina. And let's uh, have a roll call, Jen. Thank you. Okay, council member Diamond. Yay. Council member Kunkel. Aye. Council member Landau. Aye. And secretary Crowfoot. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of the work, uh, Justine and Ella and your leadership. Uh, next, we're going to dive into uh, both an informational and an action item that's related to our strategic plan goal three, which is enhancing coastal and marine biodiversity, and specifically to restore and protect our kelp ecosystems. If you're an observer of OPC, you know over the last few years, we've had a lot of intense conversation around the collapse of um, much of our kelp forest across the coast. And Mike Escrow on the OPC team has been leading efforts to both build our scientific understanding of what's leading to this collapse while taking action, recognizing the urgency of the threat. So uh, we look to you, Mike, to give us an update and to uh, overview today the proposal for the approval of funding for enhanced kelp monitoring. Yes, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, it is good to be back in person. <laughs> um, this, is, this is cool. Um, so yeah, Mike Escrow, um, Senior Biodiversity Program Manager and Tribal Liaison at OPC. Um, and as Secretary Crowfoot mentioned today, I'm gonna be presenting on two important efforts related to kelp protection and restoration. Um, first, an update on a restoration project on the North Coast that just wrapped up. Um, and second, a proposal for enhanced kelp canopy monitoring and mapping. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and just to recap, uh, both of these projects are responsive to strategic plan goal three, enhanced coastal and marine biodiversity, and specifically objective 3.2 on restoring and protecting kelp ecosystems. Um, so next slide. And just as a reminder, I know we've talked about this many times, but kelp is a foundational species that provides a lot of different important um, ecological functions and ecosystem services. But as we've seen, kelp is also highly vulnerable um, to climate change. And in 2020, actually the last time we were all together, the council approved funding for a really unique pilot restoration project um, that engaged commercial red urchin fishermen uh, to remove kelp eating purple sea urchins in support of bull kelp restoration at two spots in Mendocino County. Um, next slide, please. So before I go any further, I really wanna emphasize the partnership-based nature of this project. This would not have been possible um, without this collaborative partnership. The collaboration between OPC, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, fishermen, of course, and NGOs, specifically um, the Nature Conservancy and Reef Check California, really are what enabled project success. And specifically, I really wanna thank um, James Ray with the department, um, Kristen Ellsmore with the department as well, um, Tristan McHugh with the Nature Conservancy um, and Reef Check staff as well. And speaking of work, um, huge props to the fishermen on this project who, as you can see, just really went above and beyond. They removed almost 50,000 pounds of purple urchin over the course of two years from the two restoration sites. So really just, remarkable work on the part of the fishermen. Um, and so next slide, please. Here we can see what the impact of that restoration work was, right? So we're looking here at densities, um, individuals per square meter there on the left-hand side and red arrows show when restoration was initiated at each of the two sites. So restoration site above, no restoration um, down below. In the left panel, you can see that densities of purple urchin dropped below that dashed line. That's the magic number right there. That's two urchins per square meter. And that's the threshold that the science tells us you really need to get below 
before you can expect to get kelp back. So sure enough there um, at the restoration site, uh, urchin densities get below that line pretty quickly. And importantly, they were maintained below that line. Um, not so at the control site um, where there was no restoration happening, urchins actually ticked up. Um, and then on the right-hand panel, this is the ecological impact. So that's kelp, right? You can see that kelp density did increase significantly at the restoration site, um, much more than a small increase there observed at the control site. So next slide, please. Um, because I think a picture is worth a thousand figures. Uh, here's a couple shots from a dive I got to do on the project back in fall 2020 um, after the first round of removals. That's me on the very left-hand side there, um, grinning in my regulator because we were looking at baby bull kelp on the site already happening, um, growing in September uh, after the first round of removals in June, July. So that was really, really cool to see firsthand. Next slide, please. So what did we learn from this project? Um, we learned that commercial fishermen can be extremely effective at clearing those urchin barrens. Um, we also learned that urchin removal can facilitate kelp recovery under the right circumstances, right? Um, and before we declare victory too soon, obviously these are two sites, right? This is a much bigger problem, um, but we're very encouraged by these early results. Um, if you wanna learn more, I'd really encourage you or members of the public to read the final report it's included as exhibit A to my staff report. Um, and it's also posted publicly on our website. And the next steps here are really gonna be to explore ways to scale up this work as we seek to build a statewide kelp restoration toolkit, um, really all with the goal of more proactive climate ready management of our kelp forests in California. Um, so next slide, please. That wraps up the project update. And now to sort of move from the, the reef up to the canopy, um, I'm gonna talk about the proposed project before you today, which would improve our ability to monitor kelp canopy. And just to back up for a second, um, kelp canopy area is a really important indicator of kelp forest ecosystem health. Historically, um, decision makers have relied on plane based surveys to look at canopy data, but um, flying those surveys are expensive. Um, it's also very logistically challenging. The good news is that pilot work that's been supported by OPC shows that high resolution satellite data can serve as a really good cost effective replacement for those aerial surveys. So here you can actually see pretty good agreement between this aerial survey imagery, which is centimeter scale resolution um, versus the three meter scale resolution planet scope satellite imagery there on the right. So the proposed project here would support next steps in developing this new um, approach. Next slide, please. And so specifically, the project tasks would include using that satellite imagery um, to create seasonal statewide maps of kelp canopy, similar to the map that you can see here of Monterey Bay, um, automating that image processing process using machine learning, so ultimately saving the state time and money long term. Um, also leveraging this new statewide data set of kelp canopy to learn more about where kelp is persisting and why. Um, so kind of exploring the drivers of kelp loss and persistence, um, and then developing a new method for monitoring and mapping kelp canopy at much smaller scales, um, such as individual restoration sites, like I was talking about earlier, using ultra high resolution satellite imagery. So actually a different platform, um, incorporating that new platform in as well. So I know it's a little wonky, um, but I'm really excited about this because I just can't emphasize what a step forward this would be in terms of a real near real time um, assessment of kelp forest ecosystem health. And again, getting back to that ultimate goal of being proactive, um, being climate ready in terms of kelp restoration and protection. Um, this will really help move the needle and get us there. So next slide, please. Um, today, I'm recommending that you approve up to 650,000 um, to UCLA, go Bruins, uh, to support this novel approach. Um, I went there too, that's not just for Mark. Um, and the funding source would be our 1819 appropriation of Prop 68 funds. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you very much, all of you, um, for your time and consideration today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, so much like last agenda item, let's do this first round of, of clarifying questions and then we'll turn it to public comment and then bring it back for uh, comments from our council members. I had one clarifying question, uh, Mike, and I have to say I'm really encouraged by the by the results of 
that, uh, that sort of um, study in action that we did. Uh, for those who weren't part of our, our discussions a couple of years ago, we had fishermen and residents from our North Coast across California really coming to us, some in tears about the collapse of the kelp forest. And we talked about it as an environmental catastrophe akin to losing redwoods or the whole redwood forest, but something that's invisible because it's underwater. And at the time, <clears throat> I thought the OPC team had a really novel idea, which is we don't know what it will take to remove the purple urchin, uh, which are invasive species and bring back the kelp, but let's um, explore and, and try approaches, recognizing the urgency. And I loved the idea of bringing in the fishermen who were so passionate to actually help remove the urchin and then bringing in some valued NGO partners to manage that, but then also assess the, the results. The question I had is just the longitudinal uh, dimension here. In other words, over time. So right now it looks like when you remove a whole lot of purple urchin kelp come back, which is really, really promising. Um, are you confident that these results will hold? Uh, will you continue to assess those plots over time to see if the purple urchin um, re-infiltrate? And what's your thoughts on, you know, how confident we can be in the very promising results we've seen so far? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I mean, as you can see in the report, it took a monumental amount of effort to accomplish what I just presented. And I think all of us recognize that that's not necessarily going to be sustainable in all places at all times, right? Um, and so one of the things that I'm excited about having um, our NGO partner TNC involved in this project is they're going to continue. So OPC funding is now wrapping up. Um, TNC is going to support monitoring through another through the end of this year. So we'll get another season of kelp regrowth. Um, I showed you one site there, but this will give us two sites. And so we'll be able to have a more complete picture of Again, like that longer time series, right? Longitudinally, like you said. Um, TNC is also piloting out some interesting trapping work. Um, and so this would be like stationary traps that are supposed to aggregate purple urchins. At least that's the idea. So we're thinking as we're building that broader restoration toolkit about not just what tools should be in the toolkit, but when do you deploy them, right? So you might want to deploy commercial divers at first to kind of break the back of a site and clear a barren but then you may want to deploy traps at that same site over the course of many years to sort of support um, and protect the investment that you've already done. There's also, we're also trialing out some interesting outplanting and kelp seeding um, to see if once the urchins are gone and we can kind of like augment that kelp spore supply, does that help recovery as well? So I think it's about that, that combination of tools at different time points um, that really is going to get the results we want long-term. Really helpful. Thanks. Mike, you might want to, say how this could lead into the kelp, the kelp management plan that, that you're working with Fish and Wildlife on, on that effort. Yeah, so, so the kelp restoration toolkit that I keep talking about is ideally gonna be part of um, this broader kelp restoration and management plan um, that's being led by the department. It's just kicking off this year um, with support from OPC. So the idea is that broader statewide plan would include ecosystem-based management approaches, um, sort of your typical fishery management plan elements like harvest control rules and things like that, but also this restoration um, component as we learn more about these different approaches. Thank you, Secretary Kovic. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, as you know, I'm very passionate about this issue. I'm really, really excited to hear the updates. Could you, just before we go into public comment, um, comment a little bit on, I think it was last February that we also provided some of the matching funding for Sea Grant, for California Sea Grant to work on some of the, 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 the research associated with both restoration as well as kind of removal techniques, et cetera. Could you maybe just comment on any status updates we have from that or any progress reports just before we go into the conversation? Yeah, um, so that was back in, gosh, COVID, I guess a couple of years ago now um, that we partnered with Sea Grant for the, what we called the Kelp Recovery Research Program, right? Um, and so that's supporting six research projects aimed at looking at different um, solutions, right, to this crisis. So I think this was a really unique call in that we, you know, we were offering a lot of money um, to the top academic study in kelp in the state, but we said, you know, hey, you can't just study the problem, right? You really have to help decision makers arrive at solutions. Um, and so we've got six six projects that are really, I would say, exploring the, the drivers of kelp loss and persistence. So why did we see kelp lost where it was and why is kelp sticking around where it is? Um, some really interesting modeling results sort of getting at 
that question about which environmental drivers are the most important. So for example, not surprisingly, um, temperature is really important, urchin density is really important, but we're getting a better idea of where we can sort of accept, expect to see declines as opposed to recovery. Um, I also mentioned some of that seeding and outplanting work. So that's been really encouraging overall. We have one project on the North Coast and one on the South. Um, and so just trialing out different approaches. There's a thing called green gravel where you basically um, apply kelp spores to small rocks and kind of scatter them out and see how that works. So just applying different kinds of treatments to see if we can enhance kelp and that's going really well also. So we expect to have final results from all six of those projects by next May. Um, yeah, so they're, they're starting to wrap up and we'll certainly present those results um, as they come in. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, appreciate that. Excellent, well, let's move to public comment. And again, for those joining by Zoom, it's uh, clicking the button with the raised hand and those joining by phone, it's two pound and uh, need you in the queue at this point if you're going to speak uh, specifically to these items, uh, item number five. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. I have two people in line for public comment. First thing, Michael Brown, and then Maria Brown. Uh, Michael Brown, you have the floor. You're on mute, Michael Brown. You still need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Secretary Scopra, thank you. I apologize to uh, the audience that I wasn't able to make it up to Sacramento. Um, Mike, I, my, I guess my question, uh, it's, this is a great project and, and much like uh, Council Member jo uh, Diamond said, I, I've long been interested in kelp and uh, remember decades ago, 50 years ago, the density of kelp in Southern California, um, in portions of Southern California being huge. Uh, and much of that, much of that has been lost. Um, any comments you might make about uh, the relevance or applicability of this project in Mendocino County to more southern um, kelp forests, um, particularly in the southern central coast and um, below point conception in uh, Southern California? And if I could, just a point of clarification, Michael uh, Brown is a, is a member of the council who couldn't be here today. So he's uh, asking you a, a question. Yeah. Um, thank you, council member Brown. Yeah, I think, you know, this, the North Coast is a pretty unique system. Um, there are obviously bull kelp systems up there. Um, down south is giant kelp. But I think one of the things you'll see in that final report is there are a lot of lessons learned about this method more broadly. Um, and so one of the things is, uh, you know, in Southern California, there is a commercial red urchin fishing fleet um, that operates out of, um, I mean, mostly out of the Channel Islands, but also Santa Barbara a bit. And so, you know, could you potentially think about deploying that fleet to do something similar down south? It's a possibility, right? Um, in terms of, you know, ease of working, um, definitely the North Coast is a bit more challenging environment to work in. Um, Southern California would be a little bit easier. So I, I think like there are definitely differences, um, but there are some generalizable results across, I think, the state that, again, for that to the purposes of that toolkit that I think we could work um, on incorporating. Hopefully, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Michael. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Michael. We'll see you again soon. Next speaker is going to be Maria Brown, followed by Deb Self. Maria, you have the floor. Uh, good day, members. I am Maria Brown, the superintendent of NOAA's Greater Fairlawns and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries. I submitted a letter of support for agenda item 5A, and I'm joining you here today to share new information about how the sanctuary and OPC may partner on monitoring to restore bull kelp. As you know, we've seen drastic changes in kelp density in Northern California, and in particular throughout the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary, with a 90% loss of kelp. This has led to changes in the sanctuary and impacts to the coastal economy. 
Recently, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries was appropriated $2 million to work with the NGO Greater Fairlands Association to restore bull kelp in the sanctuary off the Sonoma Coast, where the largest declines in the state have occurred. NOAA is working with California state agencies to change the trajectory of the ecosystem from urchin barrens to thriving kelp forests. The Sanctuary, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Sea Grant, and staff from the Ocean Protection Council have jointly signed a letter of collaboration this spring that focuses on shared priorities. Working alongside the Greater Fairlands Association, we are monitoring bull kelp ecosystem health and collaborating with scientists to develop techniques to restore bull kelp ecosystems. The planned work by UCLA will help with the development of a novel remote sensing based approach for kelp canopy monitoring and mapping, which should help lessen the overall cost of monitoring. It will also help us understand seasonal variability in kelp forest dynamics that will inform kelp restoration efforts in the sanctuary. This work is a piece of what is needed. In addition, funding from the Ocean Protection Council to complement funding from the federal government for active restoration in the most severely impacted sites will be critical. I look forward to working with the Ocean Protection Council. Together, the state and federal government can leverage our combined resources to restore vital marine habitats in California. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Brown. Really excited with your announcement of that federal funding, and we very much look forward to and are thankful for the partnership that we have with, with your agency and, and other federal agencies. Thank you. Our last public comment on item five will be from Deb Self. Deb, you have the floor. Uh, Secretary Crofa and members, once again, I'm Deb Self, Executive Director of Greater Fairlands Association. Uh, as Superintendent Brown mentioned, $2 million uh, has been uh, appropriated for GFA to, for Greater Fairlands Association to restore bull kelp in the sanctuary. Uh, and we're excited to be able to work closely with and leverage the skills and passion of commercial urchin divers to begin restoration at four identified sites along the Sonoma Coast. The appropriations will support restoration probably at one site out of the four priority sites identified in the Sonoma Mendocino Bull Kelp Restoration Plan. That plan, as you know, was co-authored uh, by Rietta Homan, uh, a GFA staff member for the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, as part of the Joint Kelp Restoration Project, uh, GFA is engaged in collaborative mapping efforts that aim to map and analyze kelp abundance and distribution across the West Coast. Uh, because of this, GFA strongly supports the recommended OPC funding of $650,000 to UCLA. Uh, GFA's kelp mapping efforts use drones to provide high resolution imagery for sites in the sanctuary. And if the UCLA project is funded, then data from uh, the planet scope imagery will complement and enhance our drone studies to better understand seasonal kelp forest dynamics and interconnectivity between kelp beds and the sanctuary. On both a fine and broad scale, a new seasonal statewide data set using satellite imagery and the development of a method for mapping kelp using ultra high resolution sky set imagery will inform our joint kelp restoration efforts in the sanctuary. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you so much, Dev. There are no additional public comments for item five. Thanks so much. So let's turn to council members for any comments that you may have. Christina. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Uh, just a brief note that Controller Yi attended and was the keynote speaker at the Blue Economy Symposium in Fort Bragg just a couple weeks ago that was co-sponsored by Sea Grant and the city of Fort Bragg. And in her keynote, she highlighted and applauded OPC's efforts around kelp restoration specifically. Thank you, Mike, for your help um, giving us the update. And she reported back that the community was overwhelmingly complimentary of state efforts overall, specifically OPC's efforts around both aquaculture and, and a, a lot about kelp recovery on the North Coast and including those commercial, commercial fishermen and divers in the efforts. And I actually did attend, I recall attending that OPC meeting in 2020, I was in the audience 
Um, and I was almost in tears. Uh, I think many of us were with the public comment from the divers and who had traveled all the way from Mendocino to support that project. Um, we clearly got to see the amazing economic impact of that as well. Um, so just, oh, and praising Mike for getting in the water with them too. That was, <laughs> that's just fantastic. So cheers to you, Mike and Mark for your fantastic staff and, and seeing that giant pile of 50,000 pounds of purple kelp two years later and purple urchin, I'm sorry, uh, two years later is just emotional and, and remarkable. So that project and the other ones mentioned today really opened the door and led the way to the statewide monitoring and mapping, mapping effort that we're considering today. The progression has been spe spectacular. So thank you um, for this continued work. This is such important work. Appreciate your dedication. Thank you, Christina. If my colleague and friend, Secretary Blumenfeld were here, he would remind us that he also got in the water uh, <laughs> with, with Mike Escrow uh, and uh, put the scuba gear on to assess environmental conditions up there. And, he has a remarkable And Mike story. and his wife had to test their life-saving abilities, I can attest to. <laughs> that may or may not be true. Um, but thank you for that, those comments. Council Member Diamond. Thank you, Secretary Kofit. Um, again, uh, Mike, I'm, uh, everyone, you know how, how, how much I support this project and, and these efforts. And that's not just because I was born in the Fort Bragg Hospital, learned to surf at Albion Cove and my favorite restaurants in Noya Harbor. Um, so not just because it's home, um, but this is, I mean, I don't, it's incredibly hard to, and I don't want to imagine California's state coastal waters um, without, without kelp if, if we can't recover the 90 plus percent loss that we've experienced. Um, so hugely supportive of this. Um, and I think the idea of being able to get be kind of monitoring, this is a great investment um, and, and whatever we can do to support this is fantastic. Um, Mike, my question for you is essentially, we know that it's not necessarily feasible to replicate what we've done, you know, in partnership with TNC and ReefCheck. They've been wonderful, but we can't replicate that across the board. That's not going to be our sole removal technique. My question for you is, as we are figuring out what to do, and since we are still in the deep loss stage, are there other hot spots where we might be able to focus kind of further if we still keep calling this pilot or, you know, or something? Are there other hot spots where we should be considering whether we could continue supporting that. Um, again, considering that commercial fishermen are still not in a good spot. Um, so we do still want to be able to address that pain point, um, as well as it is still kind of an ecosystem need. Um, so again, we know we can't necessarily just exponentially scale right away. But as we do have this other research underway, etc, are there any hot spots we should be thinking about? Yeah, I think so. I mentioned that um, modeling project earlier, the OPCC grant funded project. And so the idea behind that work is to really give us a better sense of when and where different restoration options are likely to be the most effective. Right. So we can't remove every single urchin, you know, in Mendocino and uh, Sonoma counties. Right. Um, we just can't do that. But we can be really targeted in where we focus restoration efforts, whether that's urchin removals whether that's kelp enhancement, right? Um, so there's, there's different methods of kelp restoration. It's not just necessarily all about urchin, um, urchin culling or urchin removal. So I wanna see us move to a place where we have these different tools in the toolkit, but we also know where we can be most effective in deploying those. So for example, the Monterey Peninsula is definitely an area where things have been concerning. Um, overall, the central coast looks fairly stable, but things are, things are pretty alarming on the Monterey Peninsula. And so what's, what's the response to that? Probably increased monitoring, maybe smaller scale monitoring, and then thinking about what restoration options there are to deploy um, in that area, again, based on not just the ecological circumstances, but the social and economic circumstances too. Where do you have a commercial fishing fleet? Where do you have recreational divers? Where might it make sense to outplant kelp? So it's a, it's a complicated story, but I think we want to keep an eye on where our actions can have the most impact. And I know Mark's got something to add. Yeah, thank you. Um, just, just to add, Mike, to what you're saying, and, and this is why the urgency on the restoration and mitigation policy is so important, is that we take a consistent approach. You can imagine local communities all like, hey, what are we gonna do in Laguna? Hey, what are we gonna do off of Monterey Peninsula? What are we, we saw that the, um, the crisis was so severe and so personal 
um, uh, you know, off the North Coast that we kind of made an exception to the rule and saying, like, if we're going to do this, let's learn from it. And, and as you see, you know, it's a work in progress, but um, very promising what's been seen so far um, in, in what commercial fishermen can do as opposed to just the volunteer approach. That being said, people like Tom Ford have been doing this off of, you know, Palos Verdes and then Malibu for 15 years. Um, and before that, Terry Tamanen was doing that. Um, and so, um, but we want to make sure we're doing it in a consistent manner. And now that we're getting this influx of all this new science that Mike has um, described so well, um, and that we're working with fish and wildlife in this way, we're, we're really going to be smart about it, as opposed to let's just respond to the crisis du jour and in a way that the public wants us to. Um, I mean, it's hard. We're sort of in that middle spot where we're getting pushed on, oh, let's do something on Monterey, on Monterey Peninsula tomorrow, you know? And um, so we're not far away from this. Like we, we're probably gonna be six months away from being able to make answer your question way better than we are today. And definitely a year, like with all the kelp stuff coming out within a year, we'll really be a hell of a lot more informed. I really appreciate that. Thank you both. Yeah, and I'll just add, I'm for science and action. And in so many different sectors, the acceleration of climate change and its impacts means we have to move quickly, more quickly than we have in the past. And I worry sometimes the tendency to um, for paralysis by analysis. Uh, and so while I understand it's important to build the scientific understanding and encourage consistent approach approaches, what I love about this is we partnered with the impacted community to take action and to learn from it. We did it in an, in, in an informed science-based way. We assessed the, the, the impact, but I think this is an absolute success of community science um, and science in action. And I think just parenthetically for you know, the communications team of OPC, boy, this would be a really compelling story to help get out there. For me, it's so gratifying in jobs like these to be able to see a through line when we can be uh, we can learn about a problem through a public forum like this when those most impacted actually travel several hundred miles to tell us their, their challenge. And then thanks to you all, you get creative and include them in a potential solution. And then, boy, to have it uh, demonstrate some initial promising results, that's, that's incredible. So um, kudos to you all. And I think that the action item that we're considering here is particularly important because it's going to give us real-time seasonal information on, on the the state of the kelp forest. And I know when we were talking about this two or three years ago, we were dealing with dated and incomplete information. Um, so as we make these improvements, as we consider thoughtful approaches, and as we continue to engage impacted communities, we can know the, the, um, the you know, sort of the status and uh, the, you know, how, how we progress moving forward. So with that said, um, would welcome a motion from colleagues. I would move to approve action item five. I'm gonna say it this time, okay? Um, the recommendation to approve the disbursement of up to 650,000 to the University of California, Los Angeles. Can I say go bears as part of that? Um, to continue the development of a novel remote sensing based approach for kelp canopy monitoring and mapping. Thank you, so moved. I'll second. Thank you, Christina, second. And Jen, please roll. Council member Diamond. Mm -hmm. Aye. Councilmember Kunkel. Aye. Councilmember Landau. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Yes. The motion post is, is right. unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So we're going to move on to item six, which uh, keeps us in our strategic plan goal three, which is enhancing coastal and marine biodiversity, um, but a different objective, specifically protecting and restoring coastal and marine ecosystems. And joining us today, we have Maria Rodriguez, our colleague, to uh, make our presentation. Yes, um, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Crofa, Council Members, and members of the public. Um, don't want to use via Zoom only. <laughs> um, I'm Maria Rodriguez. I'm OPC's Wetlands Program Manager, and I also help lead our environmental justice and equity um, work here. Um, so today I will be presenting on item six, um, the consideration and approval of disbursement of funds for phase one of the Loma Alta Slough Wetlands Enhancement Project. Next slide, please. Um, so this project would implement strategic targets in goals one, two, and three of our strategic plan. Um, the first goal one and specific objective 1.1 is focused on building climate resiliency for coastal and marine habitats and communities. Next slide, please. 
The second goal two and specific objectives 2.3 and 2.4 are focused on advancing equity across ocean and coastal actions, including improving coastal access and healthy human use of coast and ocean resources. Um, next slide, please. And the third goal three and specific objective 3.4 are to enhance, protect and restore coastal and marine biodiversity and improve coastal and ocean water quality. Next slide, please. Uh, for this item, staff recommends authorization to disperse $1,011,391 from OPC's once through cooling interim mitigation program to the city of Oceanside to fund the implementation of phase one of the Loma Alta Slough Wetlands Enhancement Project. I'll be referring to these as the OTC program and the project moving forward in my presentation. Um, specifically, these funds are a condition of approval made by the Coastal Commission in 2019, requiring a one-time mitigation payment from Southern California Edison to OPC's OTC program to offset impacts on marine life and coastal water quality from decommissioning of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, also known as SONGS. Um, the OPC and Coastal Commission staff worked in collaboration to consider eligible projects and selected this project as the most appropriate project to direct those funds toward. Um, the restoration and enhancement of the SLU's coastal tidal estuary habitat addresses OTC program priority investment category for restoration by adding critically needed refuge for sensitive marine life within the geographic region of the Songs facility. The SLU is approximately 23 miles south of Songs, located in the city of Oceanside in San Diego County, and is a locally and regionally important um, natural resource that provides nesting and foraging habitat for marsh and shoreline birds. If approved, uh, these funds will help the city complete phase one of the restoration project in its entirety, transitioning nearly three acres of disturbed habitat into 5.8 acres of coastal wetland, mudflat, and open water habitat on city-owned property. Next slide, please. So now um, I'm going to provide a brief background on the project. Um, the Loma Alta Slough is in Southwest Oceanside on the end of Loma Alta Creek near Buccaneer Beach Park, which is a very popular destination for both residents and visitors. The slough is a small estuary that receives water flows from both the Loma Alta Creek watershed, as well as tidal flows intermittently from the ocean at Buccaneer Beach. Most of the watershed is urbanized and the slough is much smaller today than its historical condition due to urbanization and wetland fill. This has led to substantial loss of salt marsh and riparian habitat. In addition to the physical loss of wetland area, water quality issues resulting from urbanization have been ongoing since the 1960s. Uh, currently, both the creek and the slough are on California's Clean Water Act 303D list of impaired water bodies for a variety of impeding pollutants. Um, dry weather flows from the watershed provide a continuous source of fresh water that may contain contaminants that reduce the water quality by causing eutrophic conditions and the growth of algae and bacteria. Typically, water quality problems worsen during dry periods when the slough is disconnected from the ocean by a sand berm that forms naturally at Buccaneer Beach. Um, this project includes improvements to address the degraded health of the slough, the water quality issues, and restore natural hydrology to increase overall ecosystem health, the slough's habitats, and increase marine life. Next slide, please. This restoration project includes excavating tidal channels from the creek into the existing marsh to create a sinuous and branching network of channels extending from the creek through the wetlands to improve drainage and circulation. The project site would also be graded to marsh elevations with a 50 foot buffer separating the marsh from adjacent development. The restored marsh would be constructed to gradually slope up from the creek bank through intertidal and supertidal elevations, providing a range of open water depths and wetland habitat. Um, ecosystem res restoration also includes revegetating uh, wetland areas through a combination of seeding and installation of nursery grown plants. Invasive species would be removed and some of the marsh species would be planted to ensure adequate seed source and stabilize areas susceptible to erosion. Um, in addition to the restoration of nearshore and estuary and habitats, this project also proposes to incorporate public access trails and educational signage features to promote community awareness of coastal wetland habitats and their ecological importance. Uh, for example, a new trail would be constructed along the northern portion of the site, which would eventually connect to a future extension of the coastal rail trail and also connect to a new boardwalk that will be built on the western side of the site across the marsh. Um, the new trail is a critical component to improve connectivity between the coast 
and regional transportation corridors along South Coast Highway. And it also promotes carbon-free transportation through connections with regional pedestrian and cycling facilities like the Coastal Rail Trail. Additionally, this type of restoration project requires implementation that is supported by a monitoring and adaptive management framework. The adaptive management approach will rely on monitoring data to regularly assess progress of the site towards achieving the project goals and take certain actions such as modify techniques to get the project back on track and achieve project goals. Next slide, please. Um, so just to recap, uh, this project, this restoration project will provide multiple benefits by improving and restoring near shore and estuarine habitat for native species, providing increased habitat resiliency to sea level rise, improving water quality in the slough and enhancing recreational opportunities in the area. Staff recommends that the council authorize disbursement of up to $1,011,391 from OPC's OTC program, specifically the SONS mitigation funds, to the city of Oceanside to fund implementation of phase one of this project. Construction is anticipated to occur in the summer to early fall of 2023 after CEQA is completed. And it would take um, about two to four months, so approximately one season to complete construction activities. The CEQA document, a draft initial study mitigated negative declaration, also referred as an ISMND, was prepared by the city and is anticipated to be certified by the end of this year. If funds for this project are approved, um, OPC will not release those funds until after the city completes a notice of determination and certification, including any mitigation and avoidance measures identified in the certified ISMD. Um, next slide. So with that said, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Maria. Exciting project one of many important wetland restoration projects we need to get done. Any questions, points of clarification? Yeah, Christina. Yeah, just a quick question, and this is a little tangential, maybe for you, Maria, or possibly for Mark. Is uh, San Onofre still using once through cooling? They're not, right? But they still are using seawater? Yeah, they're, they're, they're still using a, a a small amount of cooling water. They're not generating, but they need to do that um, as they go through the process of decommissioning. I can't remember what the terminus date is, but it's coming up relatively soon. Yeah, the Coastal Commission's uh, ruling was that they discontinue by December 2022, and that's what this dollar amount was based off of. So my real question is, do we expect them to require additional mitigation outside of this project? No, we don't. Okay. We expect this to be the end of it. Thank you. And presumably if they don't meet that timeline, I imagine the Coastal Commission is, is monitoring that because that's a, that's a really good catch. Thank you. Let's turn to public comments specifically on this item. We have one public commenter, which is Justin Gamble. Justin, you have the floor. And I think Justin left. So we have no public comment for this item. And Justin's back, I apologize. <laughs> All right, Justin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and members of the council. My name is Justin Gamble, Environmental Officer of the City of Oceanside and the Project Manager for the Ila Malta Slew Wetlands Enhancement Project. The city is grateful for your consideration today and for your staff's recommendation to award funding from the Once Through Cooling Mitigation Program to make this valued restoration project a reality. The slough is a locally and regionally important estuary in North San Diego County. It provides refuge and nursery habitat for endangered and threatened wildlife, including the Tidewater Gobi. The original extents of the slough have been reduced by well over half since 1950 due to infill and urbanization. The project brings much needed improvements to our wetlands hydrology, water quality and habitat diversity by creating new quantifiable wetland acreage while improving the quality of existing habitat. Although comparatively small to the neighboring Buena Vista Lagoon, the Loma Alta Slough is a valued natural resource cherished by Oceanside's residents and visitors. The project has received substantial public support from the community and from state and federal resource agencies over the last three years. It will also give back directly to our community that supported its inception with the construction of our new nature trails and visitor exhibits highlighting the importance of conserving and restoring California's vanishing wetlands. The recommendation before you today will complement the city's past efforts in successfully securing funding and closes the gap for our construction, given the recent economical challenges and increases in capital costs. 
We appreciate your consideration. We thank the council for its support. Thanks, Justin, for your work on that, this important project. That is all of the public comment we have for item six. Thanks so much. Uh, comments from council members or a motion? Christina. I'll, I'll move. Uh, I just read this recommended action. I move to authorize disbursement of up to $1 million, one, $1 million $11,391 to the city of Oceanside for the implementation of phase one of the Loma Alta Slough Welt Wetlands Enhancement Project. I'm asking for an I vote. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Um, let's like Katie. Let's like Katie second that. <laughs> I will second it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, the roll. Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Kunkel. Aye. Council Member Landau. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the presentation, Maria. We're now moving to item seven, which uh, advances our, our strategic plan goal three, again, enhancing coastal and marine biodiversity and specifically to support sustainable marine fisheries and thriving fish and wildlife populations and are excited to hear um, a, a report or an update uh, presentation from NOAA. Uh, ben Arderet, uh, our colleague here at OPC, uh, for the potential funding for the review of the California Market Squid Fisheries Management Plan. Welcome, Noah. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Corporate. Secretary Kubert, excuse me. <laughs> same, and one and the same. And council members. Uh, my name is Noah Benaderet. I'm OPC Sustainable Fisheries and Aquaculture Program Manager. We're speaking today about item seven, which is a review of the California Market Squid Fisheries Management Plan. Next slide, please. This item really covers strategic plan goals uh, three and four, which are to enhance coastal marine biodiversity and to support ocean health for a sustainable blue economy, specifically objective 3.3 and objective 4.1 under those two goals. Uh, next slide, please. And our recommendation is to award $338,000 to the resources legacy fund to support stakeholder engagement um, in the Squid Fisheries Advisory, um, Advisory Committee, as well as to complete population genomics research that's currently ongoing at UCLA to inform potential updates to the state's market squid fisheries management plan. So, next slide. Oh, thanks. So this is first a little background about market squid. They're really important, but they're also really sensitive species. They live fast, they die young, they complete their whole life cycle in about nine months. So they're really decoupled from your typical year long cycle. Uh, they range along the entire California coast, but predominantly south of the Bay Area down through Northern Baja, California. And they spawn in shallow cool water habitats. Um, they're also targeted during their spawning aggregations. And they're also their recruitment to the adult population is really heavily influenced by environmental conditions, specifically cold water, but also low oxygen. And they're really ecologically important organisms, both as forage for a wide variety of species up and down the coast, but also as foragers themselves. Next slide. And while they're ecologically important, they're also really economically important as well. They're the largest commercial fishery in California by volume and second most valuable behind Dungeness crab. They're also prized by recreational anglers as bait for a variety of species up and down the coast but their landings really vary quite widely in space and time. And so you can see by referencing the two figures here, if you look at the chart, you see is that landings are the solid black line. Uh, the value of said landings are in the dashed line. And when really a takeaway from this figure is that there's just a huge amount of variability year to year in the amount that's landed. There's also a huge amount of variability spatially. So if you look at the heat map um, to the, if you look at the heat map and that's landings from 2000 to 2019, what you see is that landings are pretty spread out throughout the southern two thirds of the state. However, they're concentrated in defined hotspots. And what I want you to reference too, if you look at the far upper corner, you see there are some landings that are up on the north coast as well. And so next slide, please. And what this variability really shows is that there are existing knowledge gaps and what we understand about the fishery and about the organism, specifically 
what will happen as our marine conditions change moving forward? We're already seeing some changes and have seen referencing the previous marine heat wave. And what we see if we're looking at temporal changes, you can see, you can look at the landings in warm water periods versus cooler water periods. And each of those huge drops in landing correlate almost perfectly with either an El Nino condition or a marine heat wave. And those spikes in landings correlate really well with La Nina or cold water conditions. And what this goes to show is that as our ocean conditions continue to change, we're really unsure of what is about to happen. So if we look at the heat map again, you know, referencing this catch that was in the far north coast, we're not actually sure if we're seeing a range, potential rain shift in this species um, during the marine heat wave. In fact, Marcus Gerber found as far north as the Gulf of Alaska. Um, or if we're actually seeing genetic adaptation as well, whether it's to localized conditions, we're seeing differences in the stocks. So next slide. And so this is where OPC support is instrumental. It's really to facilitate stakeholder driven and a science-based process to update the management of the species. First, really to establish and facilitate the Squid Fishery Advisory Committee, which is comprised of managers, stakeholders, researchers, and conservation groups to review all relevant fisheries, dependent and independent data, aggregate research results, and to make in the service of making recommendations as to up, how to update the fishery, as well as the advanced research on squid population genomics. And this is to update and to complete work that's currently underway at UCLA as part of the California Conservation Genomics Project. This is to really help managers better understand the genomic structure of squid populations along the entire California coast. And this can help for a number of reasons, really to help quantify the relative importance of specific spawning locations, to better understand what is the population structure from the Southern California bite versus the Northern coast, and especially those squid that have been landed in the far North coast, coast as well. Next slide. Because really the end goal is to improve management and to really begin building climate resiliency into the fishery. So markets, the Market Squid Fisheries Management Plan was first adopted in 2005. In the time since we've really witnessed increased environmental variability along the entire coast and on our oceans. And this has really pointed to a clear need to update management as well as to incorporate the most current science into that update process. Because our hope here is to really build our first climate resilient fisheries management plan in Market Squid. So next slide. And that concludes it. Thank you so much. And I'll take any questions. Thanks so much. I have a just a clarifying question as it relates to the advisory committee uh, for the squid fishery. Just want to make sure that uh, those doing the fishing have the opportunity to participate. I, I heard I saw managers and conservation groups and others, but I just want to make sure fishers are included. Yeah, stakeholders being essentially the fishing industry. Great. Excellent. Seeing no other points of clarification, let's turn it uh, over to any public comment that may exist on this item number seven. We have a few public commenters. First is going to be Gregory Helms, followed by John Ugaritz, and then Jeff Shester. Gregory, you have the floor. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It was very hard to pick just one um, item on this agenda to speak to, but I, I really wanted to support uh, this item uh, and appreciate the partnership that OPC uh, is building with CDFW as we, as we get to eco ecosystem-based uh, modernized uh, fishery management techniques and confront um, climate change. Um, it was really an outstanding staff report and presentation that laid it all out, so I'll, I'll be able to focus and uh, you know, just a couple of things and uh, point to the very high economic and very high ecological importance of this stock and its, and its real suitability for um, really building in climate resili really resilience and bringing that to uh, policy and management simply, well, if only because the, uh, the impacts of climate are so visible and so pronounced in this fishery. Um, I also wanna appreciate uh, OPC's um, ongoing attention to um, you know, filling in gaps and, and being uh, extremely helpful where it's needed, in this case, both science and process. So I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and strongly support the item on behalf of Ocean Conservancy. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Next speaker is going to be John Ugaritz, followed by Jeff Shester. John, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and commissioners. This is John Ugaretz with California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Marine Region. Just wanted to speak in support of this funding. Uh, as Dr. Ben Adderett mentioned, market squid is unique in its lifespan being short. It is an important fishery in California, an important forage base for California's wildlife. Uh, in last year, the fishery generated the most in terms of pounds and value, beating out Dungeness crab by about $6 million. Um, and it's also unique in that this was one of the very first comprehensive fishery management plans that the department adopted nearly 20 years ago, or it'll be 20 years by the time we finish this process. And it is definitely time to review our management to ensure that our management is as modern as possible and forward-looking in terms of responsiveness to ecosystem change and global warming. So this fishery is perfect. It's a test case. It will allow us to use new tools and new science, new genomics research, and new input from the fishery participants in order to support a fishery that continues to be sustainable into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is going to be Jeff Shuster. Jeff, you have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Secretary Crowfoot and members of the council. My name is Dr. Jeff Shester. I'm the California campaign director for the conservation group Oceana, which has over 100,000 members in California. Uh, our organization and personally myself uh, have been working on uh, forage fish management uh, and, and forage species, including market squid, since 2007. Uh, we worked on the, the protection of, uh, of, the, of, the, of krill from commercial fishing, as well as uh, worked on the commission's, uh, the, the Fish and Game Commission's forage species policy. We wanted to speak in support of the funding uh, and, and recognize that this is a, a very well-conceived proposal that is uh, consistent with the department's implementation of its master plan for fisheries under the Marine Life Management Act. Uh, market squid, as you've heard, are extremely important in the marine ecosystem off of California. Um, the, the species is a forage species for many larger species of fish, uh, seabirds, and, and a wide suite of marine mammals, including uh, pinnipeds uh, and, and cetaceans. Um, we, we, uh, we do uh, support the, the, the Squid Advisory Committee and are glad to see that uh, the conservation community and conservation groups would be represented on that. Uh, we hope to see that the scope of this uh, includes uh, how we can better take an ecosystem-based approach in the face of climate change to the species. Um, we also uh, are, have been concerned with the use of uh, seal bombs uh, that are used or pinniped deterrents uh, that, that squid, the squid fishery uses uh, to avoid seals, which may have impacts on sensitive marine mammals and disrupt foraging behaviors. We also would like to see an evaluation of bottom contact of squid persanes when they're fishing at depths uh, less than the depths of the nets and the impacts this might have to both seafloor habitat and squid spawning. So uh, with that, we uh, support the funding of this and look forward to participating in the public process uh, at the department. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. That is all public comment for item seven. Excellent. Well, I'll compliment the presentation and the proposal and I'm really excited that we are focusing on building the climate resilience of our fisheries and to better understand how uh, our uh, various life in the ocean is being impacted by climate change and what that should mean to the management of fisheries. So um, really excited with this proposed funding. Uh, let me turn to Director Gold. Um, thank you, um, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, one of the things I just wanted to, to emphasize, and I'm sure you can see um, everyone participating online, that there's a recurring theme of, of today, which is we're really trying to modernize the scientific approach in a wide variety of different areas to, to meet the goals of our strategic plan. And um, I, I just I can't emphasize enough um, our sincere thanks um, in our partnership with um, Fish and Wildlife um, uh, in these efforts. So you've heard it on kelp, you've heard it on squid, um, and, and it's just, I, I can't emphasize enough how much of a partnership this really is. And um, it's something that uh, I'm really proud of um, that 
uh, you know, I'm seeing the work Mike's doing, I'm seeing the work Noah is doing, Lindsay and so many others um, in, in, in Toba with Fish and Wildlife. And this is just yet another example. And, and the modernization to really build a climate resilient fishery using the latest and greatest in population genomics to really understand that um, um, on top of some of the other things that we've talked about so far, because also Fish and Wildlife on their own is is really using the latest and greatest on ecological modeling um, and looking at this, which I think they deserve major kudos for as well. And I'm, I'm just really heartened by that, that just embracing the latest science and applying it in a way to protect um, the state's tremendous coastal resources. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Diamond. Thank you, Secretary Kofit. I'll just piggyback on that for a moment, just to say, this is following up on Secretary Crowfoot's emphasis on this in the kelp section, um, but the idea that we can be embracing and furthering cutting edge science and techniques at the same time that we're also taking action. So this is great. This will potentially be a model um, for both generating information about climate impacts on you know, indicator species, et cetera, but also updating the fishery management plan at the same time. So it taking action while also gathering the information, which has been a hallmark of, of recent projects through OPC. So just reiterating my support. Well put. Can I entertain a motion on this item? Um, I move to motion for the recommendation that the Ocean Protection Council approve the disbursement of up to $338,000 to the Resources Legacy Fund to fund the facilitation of the Squid Fishery Advisory Committee and the completion of the population genetics research. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Seconded. All right, second, seconded by Council Member Diamond. Jen, the roll, please. Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Kunkel. Aye. Council Member Landau. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is a consent item. And that means that we have placed an item on the consent calendar that we believe uh, can be approved um, by uh, the council without an in-depth presentation. And I'll share with uh, you what it is, council members. And should you have any questions, we have Lindsay Benito uh, here to answer your questions. Um, and that is... Uh, consideration, consideration of authorization to disperse funds for a budget augmentation for our marine protected area monitoring data synthesis and analysis. Now that's a mouthful. Um, so let me explain what item eight is, and it's a request for a minor budget augmentation of a previously approved project to support an entity called the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis to conduct additional data synthesis and analysis for our state's decado management review of our marine protected area network and for a data repository to house MPA monitoring data and in, very importantly to make it publicly accessible. So in other words, this is an augmentation on a grant that we approved in the, in the amount of $500,000 back in February of last year. Um, I uh, certainly would open it up to any questions you have, and if not, uh, a motion to approve this consent item. I'll move uh, to disperse up to $89,632 to the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis based at UC Santa Barbara to conduct analysis and synthesis of MPA monitoring data. Excellent. Thank you so much. Is there a second? Seconded. <laughs> Council Member Diamond. And then Jen, I think we need uh, one last roll call. I need a hand mic for the next meeting. Uh, Council Member Diamond. Aye. Council Member Kunkel. Aye. Council Member Landau. Aye. And Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item nine is our next to last agenda item. And it's an important opportunity for members of the public to comment on non-agenda items. We have a lot of topics and challenges and opportunities along our coast and in our ocean. And this is an opportunity uh, to hear input from stakeholders and members of the public on any item that is not on the agenda today. So we'll turn it over to public comment. We're gonna start oh. public comment with Walter Lamb as he does have a slide he provided to us. 
Well, um, if okay, you know what? We actually have our our, our first uh, uh, public comment in person in the form of Sean Bothwell. Um, we're we're for those of you who are joining online, we're we're really excited to have our first uh, colleague from outside of the OPC. This is our first our first meeting where we're back in person uh, since the pandemic, and um, this is a hybrid meeting. And so, as I explained in the beginning, our protocol is to take public comment from those uh, in person first. So, Mr. Bothwell. I, I was very concerned that I wasn't supposed to be here when I was the only one here. But. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Sean Bothwell. I'm the Executive Director for California Coastkeeper Alliance. I um, really appreciate the, the time to talk really quickly and I'll let you guys go. But, um, the, you know, this Council has been making uh, commitments over the last couple of years, investments in ocean acidification uh, research and modeling, uh, which have been critical for the state and really moving the science forward. And, and I really appreciate uh, all the work this council has done. Um, what we found is essentially ocean acidification hotspots are occurring off the California coast. It's not just from global climate change. It's actually coming from anthropogenic sources, primarily from our wastewater facilities, uh, which we've been studying in the Southern California bite. About two weeks ago, uh, those researchers reported out um, their, their most recent assessment, um, and I wanted to share that with you and then recommend a, a, some action be taken. I'm going to read my notes exactly because I'm too close to Mr. Gold and I'm afraid I'll get it wrong. The assessment showed that over the 2013 through 17 period, a 150% average increase in algal productivity, leading to a 3% reduction on average of oxygen concentration and omega saturation across the Southern California bite, but at levels in excess of 20 to 30% reduction in oxygen and omega saturation in the late summer. 98% of those changes were caused by point sources, anthropogenic point sources. The science is way too over my head, but it, it's worse than we thought. And it's time the state needs to start taking regulatory action and move from the science and the research to start developing a water quality, um, water quality objective. Uh, this council adopt their ocean strategic plan with a goal to get it done by 2025. In my experience, it takes at least three to five years um, to get one of these passed. So we need to get going now. Um, but while we're developing that regulatory stakeholder process, you know, there's a lot of talk in the budget right now about potable reuse and, and, and pushing that forward, which we completely support, uh, but we need to start coupling that with denitrification uh, funding. And take one more second. And um, while we're supporting those type of portable reuse projects, even if it's just one or two pilot projects to show the benefits of denitrification, really incentivize maybe one good actor or two good actors to start developing denitrification as part of their portable reuse. Uh, because another one of your goals, one, two, three, is to reduce uh, ocean discharges by 80 to 90 percent by 2040. As we do that, the need to denitrify our wastewater is going to become even that much more important. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a recommendation, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Let's move to public comment from those joining us online. We have three people in line for, for, for virtual comments. Uh, first is going to be Walter Lamb, as he does have a PowerPoint slide we're going to share. Walter, you have the floor. Walter, you're on mute. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Thank you, council members, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, we've heard a lot of really important discussion on sea level rise today, which is arguably the highest priority issue for the Ocean Protection Council. We've heard a lot of hopeful scientific advances and innovation to address the issue, but it's also critical that the principles and strategies that you adopt be incorporated into actual uh, projects. These maps, um, four maps consolidated on one slide, are from the final certified environmental impact report for the Bino Wetlands. And what they show is pretty straightforward, is they show the virtual disappearance of coastal marsh, that's the green, and the conversion of that coastal marsh into a mudflat, which is red, and subtitle, which is blue. And, you know, I think even the smartest, most well-intentioned people sometimes make mistakes. Like you know, we have some complex uh, processes where things can just slip through the cracks. That obviously happened here. And I think it's critical, and by the way, it'll happen again, right? As we work through these really important issues, there's, there will be mistakes, there will be miscalculations, misinterpretations, and that's okay. 
as long as we are committed to addressing those and not doubling down. And I feel like that's what's happened at the Biona Wetlands for the last 20 years. I think there's been so much investment into this project. And Secretary Crowfoot, you know, you talked about paralysis by analysis, and I'm very sensitive to that. Um, but I'm also concerned about the opposite, which is where people get frustrated. They, it's been such a long process. They just want to move forward with something. And I, I don't think that's helpful either. I think what needs to happen here is for us to calmly look at this science, right, that the state commissioned and put out in a certified final EIR, recognize that this is not the outcome we want. And, and this isn't just Biona. Anyone up and down the coast who cares about sea level rise should be concerned that these maps are in a final certified EIR. Decertification um, would be, you know, a slight step backward, but I think would be the action that would help move us forward. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and and thanks for providing this this um, big this uh, graphic for us. It's actually really uh, helpful uh, to your comments. Next speaker. Next speakers are going to be Bill Lane followed by Jared Bosco and then Jeff Shuster. Bill, you have the floor. Hi, my name is Bill Lane and I'm a member of the Dana Point Ocean Water Quality Committee. Um, please indulge me as you may find me uh, preaching to the choir here. My comments are in regard to the recent California Coastal Commission's permit award for the Newport Beach trash interceptor. I really appreciate the statewide microplastic strategy and of paramount importance is the pollution prevention goal of elim eliminating plastic waste source. It seems local governments are reluctant to take the lead in enacting ordinances or regulations regarding single use plastic consumption. Instead, Orange County governments have been proactive with cleanups and trash capture. Last Thursday, the California Coastal Commission permit for the Newport Beach trash interceptor was considered. Several public comment commentators, including myself, asked the commission to require that Newport ban single-use plastics as a condition to the permit. However, the commission only made the suggestion that Newport ban plastics in the future and asked them to endorse the plastic ballot measure. Then the commission proceeded to grant the permit. Sierra Club has proposed a set of plastic reduction ordinances to Newport and other cities. Discussions at Newport have been well reported by the media, and the rest of the county is watching, waiting for Newport to take the lead. But Newport City Council is still not willing to even agendize the recommend, recommended ordinances for discussion. Once Newport Beach puts the trash interceptor in San Diego Creek, Dana Point will be encouraged to put one in San Juan Creek, and so on, to capture the, pl the plastics we should not have produced and consumed in the first place. So. Don't get me wrong, trash capture is a good thing, but will we continue to treat the symptom and not the disease? Single-use plastic production creates forever chemicals. They contribute to climate change and environmental injustice. And until we can control these single-use plastics at the sort, intercepting plastic, plastic trash in our environment will never will be a, a never-ending expense. Um, Newport Beach took OPC's money to capture trash. They should also take OPC's recommendations to reduce trash. Thanks everybody, bye. Thank you very much. And I'll just note that our colleague, Senator Ben Allen has been spearheading an effort in our state legislature to consider um, significant reform of, um, of plastics and plastic pollution in our state. And that's a, that's a critically important issue for OPC. So thank you for giving this voice. Our next speaker is going to be Jared Voskul, followed by Jeff Shuster, and then Scott Webb. Jared, you have the floor. Jared, you're on mute. Hi, good afternoon. This is Jared Voskul, uh, Manager of Regulatory Affairs for CASA, the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. Uh, we represent uh, over 125 agencies and municipalities that provide wastewater collection, uh, treatment, recycling, and resource recovery. Um, sorry to not be able to join you in person today. Um, I wanted to provide some additional comments on the discussion that's being held. And uh, Cass is very appreciative of all of the OPC's investment in these many endeavors that they've been on the agenda today. Um, with regards to water recycling, 
Um, you know, we are very supportive of maximizing this around the state and supporting the water boards policy there. Um, you know, it's not a panacea though. Um, there are brine issues, uh, site identification issues, and suffice that uh, countless agencies around the state are still actively planning and constructing projects. And I think expected to double the current volume in the next five years. Um, so I, I wanted to commend them there and with regards to, you know, prospective uses of that uh, tool for other reasons than water supply. Um, with regards to the science that was mentioned, I also want to just express our support of it and the ongoing work pertaining to it and what conclusions it would lead to and policies it may guide. Um, there are numerous uh, resources for using environmental models for regulatory purposes and steps along the way, um, including model validation, skill assessments, uncertainty analyses, confirmatory lab and field studies. And with all of those boxes checked, uh, I think then it's appropriate to be deployed in those ways according to the guidances that I think are widely accepted in the field. And so we're supportive of continuing that work. And we've seen some of the research that's come out that was alluded to, and we're excited by the findings and also have a lot of questions. There was a four hour meeting on the 31st of May, which I think uh, signified how many questions there are about this and, and things that need to be run down. And we wanna be supportive of, of all of those endeavors with all the parties there together and working through this. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to, um, you know, thank the state on their microplastics work and we're doing some efforts with our member agencies across the state to help the 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 study that the LPC supported and funded a few years ago and that's led to a lot of great developments and we're going to get going into another round of it this summer and excited to get those results shared uh, with you all in the final report uh, so with that um, thank you OPC for all your leadership in these many areas and we'll see you in September thank you our next public commenter will be Jeff Shester, followed by Scott Webb. Jeff, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and members of the council. This is Jeff Shester representing the conservation group Oceana. We wanted to thank the OPC for its continued work over the years to protect wildlife uh, and, and other and fish species from bycatch in California's fisheries. Uh, this to meet the goals of the OPC of protecting biodiversity, protecting sensitive wildlife, and taking an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries. Uh, specifically, we wanted to thank the Ocean Protection Council and, and Senator Allen for the successful implementation of a transition plan for the Drift Gillnet Swordfish Fishery, which has now been fully funded by a partnership between Ocean Protection Council, Oceana, and the California Legislature that all contributed funding. As a result, we expect 90% of all active drift gillnet fishermen to participate in this program uh, by October of this year. Already over 20 tons and 20 miles of drift gillnets have already been uh, turned into this uh, uh, net collection agencies for recycling. And the new gear, deep set buoy gear, is now shown to be hugely successful, producing four times more swordfish than drift gillnets over the last two years and gaining a higher price. Also, uh, thank you for your in investments uh, to address whale and sea turtle entanglements in the Dungeness crab fishery. Uh, I, I serve on the Dungeness crab fishing gear working group, and we, we have been very extremely impressed with the OPC funded science projects, which are bringing new science to help inform our risk assessment and mitigation program. We, we, we believe uh, at Oceana that gear innovation should really be the next priority, and uh, specifically uh, the, some of the work on pop-up or, or ropeless gear that the OPC is funded with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. We're open to see that expand and, uh, and submitting it at an EFP to do continued experiments. And lastly, we are embarking now along with the department on addressing bycatch in some of California's highest bycatch fisheries with set gill nets and bottom trawls that are used to target California halibut. This is an area that the OPC could really help with in the future. And we look forward to continued partnership with the OPC to find solutions to some of these really tricky bycatch issues to uh, ensure sustainable fishing communities and mar the marine ecosystem. Thank you very much and uh, really, really uh, appreciate all your work in public service. Thank you for that really helpful update, encouraging. Our last public speaker is going to be Scott Webb. Scott, you have the floor. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Hello. 
Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Webb. I'm the advocacy manager with Turtle Island Restoration Network, a global nonprofit um, focusing on protecting oceans. And again, I want to echo a lot of Jeff Shester's concern regarding the gratitude of the OPC for its consistent work at helping address the concern of bypass bycatch. Also want to express gratitude for its work on the Jeff Gilnet and all the positive impacts this policy has done in regards to this fishery. Uh, to echo a little bit more of Jeff's uh, comments there, our organization along with the coalition of a lot of the issues are starting to focus on some of the remaining gear type that is having the biggest impact on our biodiversity on our, on our coastline, specifically set gill nets, which are pound for pound one of the worst in terms of bycatch. And it's boasting some of the highest overall impact on tar non-target species more than other commercial fishing methods. Uh, three of the four of California Department of Fish Services highest ranked set gill species or gear types to be focused on are set gill nets. Um, and this gear type has generated a lot of concern regarding stock concern um, and has resulted in set gill nets being effectively banned in state waters uh, by both the California voters and the Fish and Game Commission. Uh, however, there are still allowed in extensive areas in federal waters of Southern California near the Cortez and Tanner Banks and under, under commission authority. Um, some of our still, we are really concerned about this and similar to the drift gill nets, we're hoping to reach out to OPC for a partnership and help at addressing this fishery and these bycatch concerns to make sure that our biodiversity along the California coast is maintained and made better over time. And thank you so much for your ability to comment. Thank you very much. There are no further public comments. Thank you very much. It's a really important night opportunity to hear from uh, all, all manners of members of the public uh, about items not on the agenda. So thank you for all of those comments. Uh, Director Gold, I do think it would be helpful maybe in starting off your executive director's report in September to give us the update on the scientific findings as it relates to ocean acidification and hypoxia. I know you and uh, Deputy Director Eckerly have, uh, have organized a briefing with me just to, to, to update me on the science. So um, the beginning of our meeting uh, in September, hopefully you can give us just a summary of that. Gladly. Um, it's very important findings and uh, it's definitely, I think at that point, I think we'll be uh, ready to give a, a, a pretty cogent um, uh, description of what the findings are. Excellent. Speaking of September, item number 10, our last agenda item is just to discuss our arrangements for the next meeting. We will meet once again in person here at our Natural Resources Agency headquarters in Sacramento as well as online, both Zoom and telephone uh, on September 14th from 1 to 4 p.m. I do wanna thank my colleagues sitting to my left, uh, Deputy Controller for Environmental Protection, Christina Kunkel. Uh, thank you for being here on behalf of uh, Controller Yee. And then Katie Lando, who is, serves on the executive team of Secretary Blumenfeld at Cal EPA. And great to have this meeting with you. And as always, Council Member Jordan Diamond uh, and uh, Liz and Mark. Um, let, me, let me reserve my last thanks to the staff of OPC. It's great to see you in person. Uh, we've seen each other a little bit around the, the headquarters. I just wanna thank you for your perseverance and progress over the last two plus years. Pretty remarkable, uh, very remarkable job that you've done uh, despite not being together in person. Um, so big thanks to your leadership, uh, Mark and Jen, but really to every last person. And once again, welcome to our new permanent hires and a very enthusiastic welcome to our interns who are really the future of our environmental leadership in the state. So once again, thanks for joining our OPC meeting and we will see you in September. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.